Francisco. Good, good evening. I'm going to call to order the planning board meeting of Thursday, August 24th. Uh, it's a couple minutes after 7, but uh, we begin every meeting with public comment. This is if you have anyone here has public comment on something that's not on the agenda. If you have things on the agenda, we'll get to those eventually, but if there's something other than what's on the agenda you'd like to make public comment on, now is the time to do that. I don't see any takers, okay. So for 7 o'clock, uh, we have the item minor um, amendment to site plan for Cumberland Farms at 53 Main Street, Florence, map ID 17C-197 and 23A-77 to address underground utility conduit. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Philip Henry with Civil Design Group. We were the civil engineers of record uh, last year when we got this project approved. I think it was back in last July. Mm -hmm. uh, and since that time, uh, we have been working with um, Cumberland Farms, the utilities, and so on and so forth, and we're slowly inching closer towards construction, which is anticipated to begin within a month or so. Um, during the process of, of understanding the utilities, particularly Electric, Comcast, and Verizon, we discovered that, that our site kind of acts as a hub for then branching off the, uh, to, to, to the existing lots um, that, that surround us. So, so uh, if you're familiar with the site, uh, it's, an odd, it's an odd shaped lot and uh, the utility lines come in through the back on the bike path via overhead. And then currently they, they feed uh, five adjacent lots via overhead. However, through the process of the construction, uh, we always try to bring them underground now. So now all the utilities are going to be going underground. Uh, and in doing so, uh, particularly along the, the westerly edge uh, on um, the road that is slipping me, Bratton Court, uh, the, we, we are bringing utilities underground here. And, and what, that, what, what we learned is that we cannot have any landscaping or any physical obstructions within that uh, a utility area, uh, which would, which triggered a phone call uh, to 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 you guys, to to uh, re request a minor modification because we we if you recall we had gotten uh, part of our landscape plan for uh, 14 arborvitaes approved on that westerly edge. Uh, our modification, as I outlined in an email, uh, we are requesting the removal of 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 that of those proposed arborvitaes. Furthermore, there are also uh, existing trees within that ex uh, uh, what would be the um, utility area behind the Cumberland Farms in between the adjacent area uh, lots to our west uh, that would uh, require the removal of, of those trees as well, which then furthermore uh, triggered, um, I guess last year, r right at the time when we, when we, when we filed, a significant tree ordinance was just passed as well. So I, as an addendum to our request for minor modification, Carolyn reminded me that we need to file uh, or submit an addendum, uh, addendum letter for, uh, for those significant tree removals. So I, I included that in the packet. And um, so, so we're here before you tonight to, to, to request the removal of those proposed 14 arborvitaes. Um, if you're familiar with the site plan, I, I'm, I'm, I, I have it here. Uh, there's, there's, unfortunately, there's no more space to put trees. We, we actually have trees within, within the right of way. Uh, and then furthermore, to request uh, re the removal of existing trees as outlined in my letter. Uh, so that's why we're here tonight. So um, just to clarify, it seems like this is triggering two very sensitive things uh, for us um, as a board, which is one, the removal of existing trees, some of which are significant um, in the literal sense, not the figurative sense, and secondly, the elimination of trees that we're going to be put in. So it seems like we're losing trees both ways. Well, no, I think the, t well, to clarify, right. yes, you're losing trees both ways, except that they were already planned to be removed. It just wasn't called out. They weren't called out as specifically as the significant trees through your re review. So 
it's not that that's changing. The okay. site plan for that isn't changing. It just wasn't highlighted during the permit review. So really, the thing that's changing is that um, because of the utility um, being um, located underground, which is um, obviously thing. beneficial for the um, you know <coughs> view shed, they won't be able to plant the trees they were planning to plant, and then um, they've just identified. Um, that they will need to do some kind of replacement to offset those trees that you guys already approved the site plan but you right. just didn't get the list of the trees and all of that and because they're doing the because they're requesting the, the RBID change that triggered the other ordinance coming into play about the significant tree I mean, no it's just, it just an oversight oh, so okay. I w just going over the plans again it you know looking in that area okay I realized that we never had the discussion okay. and so it's still an ordinance it doesn't mean that you that just because you didn't talk about it then means that they're exempt right. it's just that um, uh, we didn't get to it so the only thing that's coming before you is a request for a minor amendment of the site plan to um, uh, modify the landscaping in the back of the property and there's still the proposed fence will still run along that edge the arbor variety we're going to be on the inside of the fence okay. um, so, so there's no it's issue really with the just the, um, yeah it's just the and I and I did I mean um, I did notify the immediate abutter on that mm -hmm. side just of this meeting even though it's not a public hearing and it's not well at this point I thought it was a minor amendment so it would just you guys have to approve that and make sure that you're comfortable um, but it didn't rise from our perspective to the level of um, requiring a full-blown amendment I think it's also important to note that we are s proposing to save the largest tree in that area which straddles the property line between us and, and the abutter, which is a, I think about a 27 or 28 inch tree that casts a, a pretty wide canopy over those abutting areas. So one would argue that those arborvitaes would be in the shadow of that larger tree anyway. And when we approved the original plan, was were the replacement trees also on that plan for uh, somewhere on that site or not yet? No, the only there are trees that were planned in the original plan. They're on the front. They're going to plant right, street right, trees right. on the front. So those can count okay. towards the replacement. Right. But you all just didn't correlate, you know, those trees right. um, counting okay. towards the replacement. Okay. So there's no discrepancy. <coughs> right. Right. Yeah. So we're still okay. Replacing what is being yeah. Taken. Yeah. And then you do you guys? I think I forwarded the mail, the email about the total tree. Do you have this? I, I, I um, printed extra copies if you want to just see this letter. I'm sorry if you didn't get that. Um, there's a two. <coughs> so that's the tree calculation. Okay. And I just will say that I haven't, I sent this to the tree warden just to verify the value. I haven't gotten a response back yet. I don't think, I'll, I'll double check um, to see if that value makes sense. That's something we can work out. You guys don't have to approve the value. Um, I, the way the ordinance is written is that it just has to, um, you know, they're pitching that. It, it may be okay, but I just haven't confirmed it yet with DPW. A pitching the applicants pitching this or the no the applicant is saying this is how much the value is for planting the number that they're not going to be able to do on site right. so what their option in the ordinance allows for off-site um, payment to the city right. for the city to put into the tree fund yep. to plant mm Any other comments, questions? I'm okay. This it's a very limited site. Ultimately, it's going to be improved because the utilities are going underground. Uh, it's a shame we can't get the arborvitaes, but I don't think. I mean, the applicants acting in good faith, and if we can't put the trees there, but we get money toward the the general tree fund, and we put trees somewhere else, I'm I'm fine with it. Does oh, yes, sir. Uh, even though it may not be appropriate, is this uh, available for public comment? Yes, you can if, if you just come up and identify yourself. My name is Chris Kennedy. I am the abutter in the back. It's going to be immediately 
affected by the uh, change of the arba vaidi and i guess i'd like to know exactly uh what the changes are do you have any uh diagrams or plot plans or something that you can show? Because originally it's been what was filed with the city and the planning department. I think there's about 11 or 12 trees. I just, and three of them were scheduled to stay, all of them significant. I just heard you say a tree. That means one tree. So that has changed from what the original yes. plans that you submitted yeah. were? Right. And the tree that straddles really does straddle, so it's actually beneficial for you to leave it. Uh, because it's going to be, would be, a pain in the butt to take out that it straddles. So and the second question is, what actually is going to replace the arborvitae, and how is that going to affect the distance between uh, property zones, property lines? So, Carolyn, do you, do you have a digital copy? Um, I just have, I do have a copy on my screen. I could um, probably put it up. Because um, I, I have, I have one on my thumb drive too. Yeah, I'm just. Um, Before and after eight and a half by eleven. If you want to share that. Sure, I have eleven by seventeen. If if you wouldn't mind, yeah, if I you can, can pop it on the. With, with if you want to pop it on the thumb drive, okay. um, on there, just because that one's already con the, the screen's already connected and it would take probably sure. less time to. It's on the upper right, over by that where the lock is, I think. So just bear with me here. So this is the subject area that we're, that we're discussing here, this area in the back. Uh, these are the 14 arborvitaes that prior to our in-depth conversations with National Grid, Comcast, and Verizon, we were proposing to, uh, to, to, to implement and install. And then furthermore, there were existing trees here, which I don't think show up because of the hatch, but they're called out on the demo plan. Most of them were B2 removed, uh, and then we, but we were trying to save, I think, two, two or three trees. And then the, the existing largest tree here is right where that mouse is. Uh, that, that's the one that straddles the property line that we think that we can save. So in discussions with the the utility companies, I'll jump to the utility plan. As I was saying, the, 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 the uh, power lines come in from, from the north and they stay overhead and they feed uh, the first two lots on two Brighton Court, and then they feed uh, Mr. Fox property in the back and Mr. Fox property up, up front. So our, and our site, and the existing Edward Jones building that uh, we're purchasing. So it, it, our site acted as a, as a hub and everything stayed above ground. As you'll see here in this area, right in here, that all the utilities that, that are serving the, two, uh, the Bratton Court are going to be stretched right behind this building, including our electrical feed and our cable feed down here. So from here under, this is all underground. And as you can see here, uh, we're running probably four or five four-inch um, lines here to, to feed the electrical telephone and cable. Not to mention that this box here is a, it's, called, it's, it's an underground handhold box. It's a picture as a, as a square manhole for, for access. So once we got to the, the easement stage with National Grid and Verizon and Comcast, the easement read that there should be no physical obstructions within that easement. So that's what triggered us uh, calling, calling the city. Where is, was the fence? The fence is, it's probably tough to see on this plan, but the fence 
we is on the property line. It's actually on this plan. So this, so this uh, dashed thick black line, which is the property line, that fence is going to run on that property line from, from here where my um, mouse is all the way down to the front of the property. And what is the material? What kind of a fence it's, is it? It's going to be a six foot high white vinyl privacy fence. It's going to be completely opaque. So the uh, plantings would have been on the? Site side. On the inside? On the inside, yep. So we're not we're not um, removing the the direct um, or, or I would argue that we're not changing the 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 immediate obstruction in front of the abutters property, yeah. which would be that fence. So as you and so so before we we, we approached the city, we we looked at the site and and we and we asked ourselves where where could, where can we plant more trees. Um, Un, un, unfortunately, there there is b because of the uniqueness of the lot and and the fact that there's no landscape separation between us and our butters to the to the to the north and the west. There's no there's there's physically no landscaped area to plant the trees, and where we do have landscape, which is along the front, we 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 have that. How big and where are the trees that everybody thought were going to stay, except now they're not? Where where were they? Well, where are they? They're yeah. still there. The existing trees? Yes. They're Other than the one that stayed. Yeah, they're they're in they're in this area, right here on the mouse, okay. where my mouse is showing right here. And how big are these trees? The existing ones? Yeah. I mean, they range. Um, I would think the largest ones are, well, I mean, we actually denote them. They're, they're in excess, I think two or three are in excess of 20 inches. Uh, some of them are eight inches, some of them are 12 inches. Uh, I would have to dispute that fact. Uh, okay, just one at a time, and then I'll, thank you. Okay. Uh, anything else for the? No. Okay, yes, sir. I'd have to dispute the fact in the second. If, if, I'm sorry, because of the recording, we have to have you. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to dispute the size of the trees because um, of being of interest to me. I went out and actually measured them, and uh, almost all of them are over 21 inches. The smallest one is 21 inches, so we're looking at 12 or 14 trees that are 20 inches or more. These are big trees. Height-wise, they're probably as tall as a three-story building. So these are not just small bushes. These are large trees which make a major impact uh, for coverage as well as aesthetics to my backyard. Um, so I'd just like to clear that, if that makes a difference to you, that mm -hmm. the, the diameters have been misrepresented. And you can always make a site visit if you like and measure them firsthand. Um, the second thing is, um, in, for fencing, is that fence right on the property line or is that set off by a one foot standard uh, zoning request that a fence not actually be on the line but be offset by one foot? Am I mistaken in that, or? We don't have a setback for fences. For fences, none at all, so they can go right flat on the property line itself, okay? And where was the original fence going to be? Has that been moved at all? No, the uh, fence has not changed. Okay, so it's if, exactly where it shows up. If I could ask you to, you, the, this is really a conversation with us and not, so if you could address your questions to us and then we'll get you answers. Okay. So just. That's just the way it works. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the, the fence is, is where it was. Was just the yeah. aren't on the on the on the uh, inside side. side. On the right. side side. Yeah. Which they were always going to be on the on yeah, the side right. side. Right. So that part really right. is that's it's different just, than the trees. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are two different. Mm -hmm. And I would just say two things. One, um, I think it would be uh, so. I think um, I don't know. If Mr. Henry can elaborate, but I, I believe their landscape um, architect went out and confirmed the measurements taken at a s specific um, um, height right. above Standard. grade. So there may be some differences there in terms of where you measure on the tree and what that number is. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that can certainly be confirmed by the tree warden, but their landscape architect gave the numbers as far as I know. Um, and then in terms of the exist the tree that will remain, I think it would be important to 
as a condition of this that the um, tree protection measures be inspected by the city before any construction starts um, because that will be an issue, um, that could be an issue during construction if, if the protection area is not adequate enough. Is it within our um, purview to also condition the tree warden site visit to confirm measurements or is that something that we normally don't do? Uh, you can't direct some city staff to do certain things. Okay. You could, um, um, you know, you could request that a plan be stamped, that submitted and stamped by the landscape architect indicating what the measurement is because, you but know, we, we rely on the stamp. I don't have a stamped plan. I just, the, um, the yeah, right. So we could certainly have a stamped plan submitted to show what that measurement is. Can those trees be? Put on the on the butter's property, the new part of these twelve thousand nine hundred sixty dollars worth of trees. Our providing? No, yeah. the the replacement. The replacement trees. Oh, I mean, um, it seems like that's part of. I, I mean, I, you I can't you can't regulate that. You can't tell them to do that. If they want to make a side agreement, they can. Okay. Um, but um, what's in front of you is what the applicant has. Got it. But to follow up with Sam's question, would the applicant could would they get credit towards this twelve thousand yes. yes. if they make if they worked out of a mutually right. beneficial agreement right. and that that so it's not they're not getting gov double right so they right. would get credit they for they could it. do it but you can't tell them I, I understand right. I'm saying in the spirit of a wonderful city of Northampton <laughs> it seems like everyone here could look at each other and say hey let's have some coffee and work out an agreement because it wouldn't <laughs> cost them any more that's what I'm saying right, right. Okay. Right, right. So, okay. I just have questions yes sir okay uh, what was the tree protection uh, measure what does that entail because if they're excavating around the area and they lob off half of the trees feeding roots that's really going to be long-term detrimental to the tree so can you people spell out to me exactly what the tree protection measures are and does that take into the effect that um, not to destroy the root system for this one major tree that apparently is the only tree that's staying um, the uh, tree protection measures are stand are standardized we rely on a standard um, um, that's published um, and it depends on the tree so I can't tell you what the space would be f for this tree but what does happen is um, developer um, has to follow the criteria in this published standard then the city checks it to make sure it makes sense some root pruning is fine and can be done sensitively without hurting the tree so it's not that no root pruning would happen but um, it has to be done in accordance with published standards for protecting trees is there an ordinance number or something that goes with those printed standards that I could access it's not a city ordinance but it's um, uh, you if you want to find out, well, I mean, it's referenced in the, in the city's ordinance, the, the protection, so you can go in the 12, section 12.3 12 of our ordinance, and it references this other um, ANSI standard that you can um, try to look up. And that's so. a government uh, standard, either state or federal, or no, that's it's, a No, it's trade like a third party, yeah. Um, it's, this, it's a whole group of standards that are sort of, um, that range the, from it's not just about tree protection but it's you know all it's sorts of practices yeah and you said that just on that point you said that we could create a condition that the tree protection measures be inspected prior to construction prior to yeah. to make sure that whatever the standards are, that they are being right that the okay yeah. yeah the second question I had you measured that there was a, uh, a standard height from which the tree warden would measure from the ground mm -hmm. do you know what that height is because I measured it at, a, at about waist height or about chest height yeah I mean it's it's diameter breast height it's about five feet above grade okay then my original my original statement stands that there are the majority of the trees are over 21 inches in diameter sizably over 21 inches in diameter so uh, perhaps tree warden can come out or something whoever made that original estimate could actually uh, come out and take another look at it 
with the property owner there this time and i'd gladly make myself available to meet him there because there seems to be a major discrepancy in how the trees are measured and what the sizes are that are coming out it's an important issue for me so i'd like to see it brought and could the, and could the condition of a stamped plan address that that we you know that it so, uh, someone needs to professionally put on there that this is what, and that would address. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, so I measured the trees. So I'm, I'm, in a, I'm a professional engineer, so I'm not a landscaped architect, but I think I think I could measure a tree. So um, it, it was it was my understanding that, you know, we measure it at breast height, but it, it is what it is, right? So it, it, there, there's one right answer, so we can all collectively go on site. So right. th th this was my interpretation of the right answer, but if someone else doesn't, we, we want to get it right. right. So we're not here to, to, to do something that, we're, we're here in good faith. We, we want to make sure we can proceed with this project. That's our goal. So, if it, so basically what happens is, you know, let's say one is 19, one is 23 inches, you know, whatever it is, the ordinance says you're replacing for that. So if it's 23 instead of 21 inches, then they have to do two more inches of replacement. Right. right. So, okay. And, but I, I do think, and I appreciate your, yeah. your comment, I think that, you know, these two measures, if, if, if we were to have conditions, I'm not <laughs> telling folks what to do, um, I think would bring some some confidence and, and some resolution to the, the abutter that, hey, everything, we've gone by the book, everything has been done that can be done, and, you know, and, and you've stated that, you know, you, you intend to do that in good faith. So I, I think it's just, it's a, it would be a nice reassurance and, uh, and give everybody feeling like, okay, everything's being done that can be done, and we're following all the, the guidelines. Is this something that's going to be official? Uh, and signed off on, or if we make it, if we make it a go up and we're going out and measure trees and yep, have a nice day. And no, if, if we make a condition, then it has to be before they would be able to do construction. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, it would it would be, it would be a condition from for the permit. Okay. So I didn't overstate that, did I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. Is, is there going to be any noise factor or anything from the change in the way that? Um, being underground as a put transformers or anything going to change or the, the volume of uh, current that it's going to deal with? Is there going to be issues, any noise issues that are going to change as a result of the cables going, being buried? One would think not, but I'm. Uh, I would think ask. not, but you have clearly asked a question that is beyond my yeah. <laughs> expertise, but I would think not. You know, in fact, I would think it would be better, but you know, so from that standpoint. Okay. So, okay. Any other questions? Not that I can think of immediately. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we get that a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions on the board? Would anyone Let's close like public comment? Second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Uh, any discussion or suggestions? And we've already had a little bit. Anyone would like to make a motion? Motion to approve minor amendment to site plan for Cumberland Farms at 53 Main Street, Florence, map ID 17C-197. Uh, to address underground utility conduit with the following two conditions. First, that tree protection measures be inspected before construction begins. And the second, that a stamped plan containing tree measurements be submitted um, prior to construction. I have a second. Second. Mark, all in favor? Yep. All opposed? It passed. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you both for your civil discourse. <laughs> if I may, just just one unrelated topic. I had I had dropped off the uh, A and R lock consolidation. Oh. So I'm. Um, this is just an. So I just need a vote to, for the endorsement of this A and R. They're just going to merge the two lots for purchasing. Um, oh, the, yeah. They're not quite ready to have it signed, but since they're here now and we have a plan, I just wanted to get your vote on that. Motion to endorse A&R. Second okay. by Ann. Any discussion? All in favor? Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next item is a request for 40R approval by Valley Community Development Corporation for renovation to 15 units and additional uh, addition of 16 units at 82 Bridge Street, Northampton, map ID 32A-178. And uh, do we have a presentation? I guess that we do. Hi. Hi. 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate project manager at Valley CDC. Um, my understanding is we'll do as brief of an introductory presentation as we can, and then, of course, take your questions. Um, this is a front view of the property. It's located at 82 Bridge Street. Uh, it is a walk to town location close to the bus stop uh, in front of the post office, and it's about a half acre parcel of land. Uh, these are just some photographs of the existing building, uh, the, starting at the top left with the view kind of facing the driveway, and then deeper into the driveway, the kind of back building and garage, front of the building again, and then around the back side with the fire escape. Uh, these are uh, just a few highlights of the existing conditions. The house was constructed, we believe, uh, in 1820. It is a contributing structure in the Pomeroy Terrace Historic District. Uh, it served, has served since 1990 as a 15-room sing, room single room occupancy uh, slash lodging house. Uh, it means that people basically rent a bedroom. Uh, there's a shared, one shared kitchen and four shared bathrooms. Uh, the building is very tired and in need of both structural and capital repairs. Uh, it currently has no handicapped accessibility to any level of the building. Um, some of the rooms are teeny, under 120 square feet. Um, and it has generally been occupied by low-income single adults. Uh, some highlights of existing conditions, again, the, the fact that there's not handicapped access in the building, and a few, you know, photos of some structural issues that are, that are apparent in the building. Um, the purpose of this project is legion. Uh, we're going to hopefully address the current capital needs and correct any safety defects that are there in the building. Um, we are planning to install an elevator uh, that would give access to all the different living levels of the building uh, and create three fully handicapped accessible units, uh, get rid of the small teeny rooms, uh, and the average room size will increase to 250 square feet, uh, install a kitchenette and bathroom within each unit. So they're turning really from a lodging house to kind of efficiency apartments. Um, reserve up to 25% of the total units. We're thinking eight units for homeless uh, applicants, uh, include some services. Reserve two units for Department of Mental Health referrals. Um, serve tenants at a range of income levels, but with an emphasis on extremely low income tenants. And you see the breakdown of different income tiers that we would try to achieve in the property. Um, and undertake historic restoration of the main house. So this is the architect's rendering of what the addition would look like. Um, we couldn't get a lot of angles on what the addition would look like to the public because it, it, it's only from standing at one very specific angle that you would see the addition at all. Um, part of the goal of this was actually to tuck it behind the historic house so it doesn't present on the streetscape. Um, but if you stand just right um, and look down the driveway, you can, you can see the addition in the back. Um, this is a view of what that addition would look like if you were in the kind of garden area behind the buildings at the historic Northampton campus, kind of looking over behind other properties. Um, this is a photo showing uh, what this house looked like, we believe around 1950, um, and it kind of captures some of the things we hope to achieve in terms of restoring the front of the building. Um, so at some point, Somebody put this kind of wide aluminum siding over the original clapboards, the clapboards you're seeing there. Um, we'd like to strip that and put hardy panel clapboards that will look just like old clapboards back. Um, when they did the aluminum siding, they, they stripped those decorative caps, those little kind of ledgers that are over the windows were taken off. Um, we'd like to restore those. Uh, replace the existing vinyl two over two windows with fiberglass six over six windows. That was a suggestion that came from the historic commission. Um, and then reinstall or replicate existing exterior trim. There's some kind of nice upper trim, soft and fascia trim that's pretty rotted, so it might have to get um, reproduced. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Carlos from Berkshire Design Group. He'll take you through the next couple of site related slides. Um, yeah, good evening. My name is Carlos Nieto. I'm a landscape architect with uh, the Berkshire Design Group. Um, I've been working with Laura Baker and Valley CDC uh, for this project and the site aspect of, of the project. Um, this is just a quick graphic, just getting us a little bit more um, to know where the site is. And the blue uh, ring around it is our 300-foot um, 
from the property line, so it would be the area of the abutters that would have been, um, you know, told that the project was going to happen. So I always want, like to get a sense of what the where the project is and what the size of that ring looks like in real life. Um, yeah, as you can see, the the project location is right in the center of that that circle, and then to um, the north, you got the Bridge Street School, and then Bridge Street right in front of it, um, and then the historic court Northampton, and also the uh, next house over uh, to the uh, west and then to the east one other butter uh, and then across the street you have several other buildings including what used to be the um, the motel I believe or that that those um, longer structures I just wanted to make sure you you got yourself located where we are um, this is an existing conditions and demolition plan uh, for the site um, as Laura mentioned um, this is the existing house on our side is a pretty narrow narrow site and also small. Um, um, there are several uh, to achieve the, um, and I'm gonna just jump quickly here. This is what we're proposing. So the expansion of the building, to achieve that expansion of the building, there are several trees that will have to be taken down um, and also for the uh, stormwater management uh, for the site and also for the new driveway or extended driveway and parking area. Um, of those, there are going to be, I believe, four uh, that are significant trees. We've um, notified uh, planning on what those trees are, what the DBH is, and at this point, we're planning on, on paying the city uh, for, for those trees because really on the site, as you will see in the next slide, um, we, we have very little space to actually plant the number of trees that we would need. So I'm going to run you from the front of the property all the way to the back. So uh, in the improvements that we are proposing, um, site-wise, um, we are improving the sidewalk in front of the building, uh, which was uh, a request. And also, it is in, in not the best shape, but it was a request also from DPW. So we are going to be, we're proposing we're going to be uh, uh, fixing that uh, sidewalk right in front of the property. Um, there's going to be a picket fence. Um, um, very similar to the picket fence that we had on the historic. So we are adding a picket fence so that the streetscape keeps going, um, continues as, as you keep going. Um, let me just go back to so that will be uh, the treatment on the front of the building. Um, the existing uh, walkway that goes to the main entrance of the building will be, right now, um, it, it's also asphalt and it's not in good shape, so we're proposing a con changing that to concrete, as well as uh, connecting, having a, a new connection to the parking lot on the back. So there's a walkway that would lead you uh, from the front entrance to the back where the parking lot is. Um, and the idea is that so people are not necessarily walking down the driveway. Um, again, um, there's this, the pinkish or purplish color. That's what's going to be remain of the existing building that we have. And everything beh uh, behind that, that's going to be the addition um, some of it, as you saw before, is going to be demoed. So some of this area on the back on the original building are going to be demoed and it's going to be rebuilt. Um, as we keep moving back um, to the north uh, side, there's going to be a, a deck um, uh, that will be accessed from the first floor. Um, and as we, again, keep moving back on the existing driveway, which used to end right about where my mouse is and that line is, and I wanted to make sure that you understood how you know what that what that was and what it's going to be now. Um, there's going to be uh, an extension of the driveway, an extension of the parking spaces to accommodate for the increased um, apartments in in the site, and then all the way to the back, we will have a, um, a trash receptacle area which will have a screen, a wood screen, six foot wood screen around uh, around it, and then a bicycle shed for about 20 bikes. That's what we're proposing on the back end of, of the property. Um, in addition to that, I'm, I'm, we are going to keep an area of, of open space. Um, this uh, rectangle that you're seeing, and I wanted to point that out, is the area where we're going to have our infiltration area for the um, stormwater management. And that's one of the reasons why we have to take down some of the trees. And because of having that infrastructure there, we can't really plant trees on top of it. Um, that would defeat the purpose of the, uh, it could clog in uh, the uh, drainage system. So um, what we are proposing, and I believe originally there's been some revisions to the plan, the original plan that you saw, and some changes. Um, uh, as of right now, we are we are proposing um, to uh, to plant two uh, additional 
trees, these are Emelanchir's uh, service berries, uh, so they're not gonna be hu huge trees. And one of the problems that we were, we have in this site is that the, the trees were very, 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 very big for the site itself. So uh, coming back and planting some trees that are gonna be the right size for the site. Um, I believe that's, um, there are existing, you know, large trees that are gonna be, uh, are there to be, to remain and a uh, part of the way that we are grading the driveway and what we're proposing is that we are just gonna be underneath that root system. We're just gonna be removing the asphalt and leaving as much as we can the uh, sub base um, and then paving on top of that so to minimize the disturbance on the roots. In addition to that, as you've probably uh, read, um, as one of the things we will need um, an arborist to come in also and do some recommendations on how to uh, prevent any root damage or damage on those trees and that's part of the things we're proposing to do. Um, in the back right next to the deck, uh, we're proposing a, a line of about 10 to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight uh, sorry, um, screening uh, uh, trees or, or arborvitae um, that are, we are gonna be using to uh, screen that uh, deck um, that we're gonna have out. Uh, on the side. Um, this is just a, a quick look. Uh, Utility-wise, uh, the major utilities that we're going to be adding here is a, a drainage system because of the increase of the uh, of the pavement, and the fact that before, basically, the water was just draining and not there was no catch basin or anything in the parking lot. So we're improving the parking lot that way. Um, that drainage system will also collect some water from the yard and also the water from the downspouts in the, in the building. Um, as a requirement of, for the addition, uh, there's gonna be a replacement of the water line, so it's gonna be increased in size for the domestic water line. The fire suppression uh, system water line that exists is, is sufficient, so we're not touching that one. Um, but also the sewer line is also gonna be increased, and we've been in conversations with DPW to coordinate that and the last, um, as, as of a couple of days ago, basically, um, they, uh, their response was that it was okay, they will require us to have a new um, sewer manhole, uh, which we're, we've agreed with, and uh, the idea is that there are the two manholes for the sewer system are very far away from this location, so it will be um, good for us and for the city to have a new manhole there. Um, so utility-wise, um, that, that, that is the majority of the utilities. And my understanding is that gas and other lines are gonna be reused or they're gonna be um, uh, evaluated by um, the gas companies and just to make sure that everything works. Um, and so that is our utility plan. Um, and I will leave it to Laura to go over more of the architecture and the changes in, within the building. Thank you, Carlos. So, um, this is a demo plan. Uh, Carlos pretty well covered it. You know, the, uh, the plan is to preserve that kind of main four square part of the building. Um, and then it had kind of a little back building that's coming down and it has three funky garages that are coming down and that's kind of what that's attempting to show. Um, this is the floor plan for the first floor. Um, again, the, the main part of the building, which is facing Bridge Street, is very four square. Those are existing rooms that'll stay. Um, kitchen, kitchenette and baths will be added. Um, the middle section is intended to be a common area for use by tenants. Um, the elevator is set up so that you can come on at grade because the first floor is, you know, I don't know, 30 inches up. Um, so no ramp, hopefully, for this building. Um, so you, you come in uh, into a little lobby off the elevator and you can go to the right, go back to the original part of the building or to the left into the new um, addition. And then the upper floors are all residential. Again, the, the pattern repeats in the main building. Um, that connector building has two rooms and you know they just kind of stack in the new addition. Um, the large corner uh, apartment in the uh, addition is the handicap unit and it'll stack so there'll be three of those, one on each floor. And then the upper floor, what's happening now in the main building is we actually have four tenants living on the what's essentially the attic of the building, and that's where we're getting some of those really undersized rooms and, you know, not good heat and things like that. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna actually reduce the number of uh, units in the old part of the building um, because there will only be two up there on the third floor. Um, these are elevations. 
we're showing the front of the building. Uh, again, the attempt has been to really tuck that new addition behind it. And even though it's kind of sticking out on the side, it's about 100 feet back. So it's set, set pretty far back on the lot. And the lot is narrow, so we don't think you're going to, unless you're looking for it, that you're necessarily going to be struck by it as you're either driving or, or walking by. Um, and then you're seeing the backside, which is a little bit more modern looking. Um, and this is the side that would be facing away from the driveway. No, this is, yeah, away from the driveway. And then that's the side that would be facing the driveway with kind of a little side porch that we're rebuilding. And that's it for that. Questions from the board? Uh, first quick question, easy one. Is the stormwater been reviewed by or signed off by DPW? Um, yes, so the DPW gave a series of comments. We got them today. Um, they don't have a separate stormwater permit because it's less than an acre. Um, but they're, they um, have approved the um, plans for managing the stormwater and um, then have uh, recommended a series of conditions related to finalizing that and finalizing the maintenance agreements prior to construction. So and I can go through, whenever you're ready, we can read through the And I'm sorry, I just, I forgot, I skipped over. Is there anyone from the public that would like to make a comment on this particular project? Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Miriam Moss, and I live at 5 Aspen Lane in Northampton. I've lived here for five years from Philadelphia suburb. And I was struck as I moved here about the fact that it seems that there is not very much inexpensive housing for older, middle-aged, and younger people here. And I'm very pleased to be here just in support of this particular project. It seems like it's hard to find things that are wrong with it in the general sense. The general sense being that, look, it's already there. It works there. It's going to be much better. Twice as many people are going to be there. It's going to have accessibility within. It's going to have not these tiny 10 by 12 or 10 by whatever they are, uh, rooms, they're going to be real living spaces. And I, it seems that the people who live there, from my understanding, but that's all I know is from hearsay, is that no one has raised problems about, from it from the tenants. And I'm not convinced that it would be likely, uh, given the, the description that you've been given, that it would be uncomfortable for people who live adjacent to it, or as you call it, abutting. Uh, so I'm just very impressed by the first conversation that went on uh, with the other proposal up in uh, other part of the city. But I'm really impressed by the fact that I've always been involved in environmental things, and this is really environmental stuff in action, where you're concerned about trees, you're concerned about water, and everybody has been really responsible and thinking about it. So I'd urge you to approve it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Madeline Blanchett, and um, I live at 41 Valley Street, and I'm actually a Northampton native. Um, and I'm here in support of the project. I actually am on the board of Valley CDC. I became a volunteer in the last couple of years because I saw the positive impact that they were having on my Ward 3 neighborhood. So I just wanted to say, um, couple things um, just uh, that I I have um, spoken extensively to my neighbors about this plan um, I used to be the vice president of the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association so I'm not speaking for them but I'm just trying to give you a sense that I'm quite well networked and I actually attended um, the open meeting that um, Valley CDC had at Bridge Street School and where um, you know, it was really, I think it was publicized through the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association. And, you know, people are just very positive about their project. They um, are uh, very um, grateful that Valley CDC is um, 
you know, doing such a high-end project in terms of actually the front of the house will be more historic. It's actually going to be more in keeping with um, the historic district that has formed at Pomeroy Terrace and, of course, uh, historic Northampton, which is kind of a gem for the whole community. So um, anyway, I just wanted to say that the buzz in the neighborhood is, you know, very positive about the project. Um, people who live in the neighborhood know that um, um, as been alluded to that the Shaw's Motel, that, they were, that, that there was a lot of um, single units there and that then above, um, is it Augie's, is that what, what is now the um, antique store, that that also used to be able to house some of our uh, lowest earning community members and those units are all gone. So, you know, that's something that is really concerning. So I would say that to me that this is sort of reflects the best of Northampton values where um, the design is thoughtful, where it promotes economic justice, and it's also, um, you know, really reaches up and uh, blends in with the best of the aesthetics of the neighborhood. So I, I really uh, hope you'll support it. Thanks. Thank you very much. Anyone else that'd like to speak? Hi, I'm MJ Adams, and I resident in Northampton, 60 Norwood Avenue, up in Bay State. But I grew up in this town, and that neighborhood has always historically been a neighborhood that was pretty densely developed. It actually used to house a lot more single room occupancy, but over time, things have changed, and it's a real delight to see that use going more intensively back into the neighborhood, particularly the historic character that the CDC, CDC is going to restore. And But I think that the whole project is great for the neighborhood, great and great for the community and really responds to the needs of that income range that really needs affordable small units in, in downtown and not so heavily reliant on having a car to be able to live in this community. I also want to say about the critical importance about the, the handicap accessibility. Last summer at the tail end of the uh, Northampton Lodging House Live, I was actually the night manager on a couple of nights. And I know the population pretty well and I just wanted to say that expanding easily accessible units to, to folks is so critically important. Uh, so I really appreciate Northampton giving this good consideration. I think it's a great project, great for the neighborhood and great for the community. Thank you. Anyone else like to make a comment? Okay. Uh, comments from the board? Uh, could someone explain just roughly the, the traffic mitigation slash parking slash bus plan slash, you know, this. Mm -hmm. So um, because the um, project um, is adding units, um, residential units um, by zoning need to address, and other projects too, need to address their incremental impacts on, of traffic. So um, the... Um, We've had a dis staff has had a discussion with the applicant how they could do that. Um, they have um, shown so the the zoning um, sort of predicts based on um, study about how many trips are made by different users. So there's not a specific SRO use classification in the ITE or any um, you know, other um, guidance. So what we look at is was the multifamily. Um, um, trip generation assumptions and um, we also know we there was information provided by Valley CDC about the the population that they serve how many cars are actually owned by their um, clients and um, um, try to work and provide a um, workable solution that makes sense for actually w the number of automobile trips that are being generated given the population. Um, so we also have a provision in the ordinance that um, sort of just like um, um, what the staff memo reflected in terms of um, accommodating the different type of population. Already in the zoning, we have a reduction in parking required for um, um, uh, housing classification for people who don't typically drive. So it could be um, um, older residents who might not have cars or um, people who just um, can't afford them or don't want to afford them. So using that as um, 
um, helping the formula to think about in terms of traffic mitigation, um, we came up with um, a calculation, I guess jointly, I think that was agreeable with Valley CDC about using that to sort of have the, um, what would typically be a standard for trip generation for residential units. I think, um, say something. I'm going to, I think I was reading in the application that only half of the existing parks lots they use, I mean, half of the stalls they have have not been occupied, so it's already a tendency that, right? I mean. Right. 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 So, um, so I think that, you know, that um, confirms, yeah. and it's not sort of, we're not um, pulling this out of whole <laughs> cloth, I guess, is on the way to say it. So, um, and then the other piece of it, so I think I'm just pulling out the numbers because I didn't have them off the top of my head. Um, and I don't know if, um, Laura, you wanted to speak to that, but. Um, yeah, the other part of the question I heard is, you know, so with the bus pass, bike <laughs> share thing, what we talked about was, you know, that property management would set up a fund using those, I think it was $8,000, mm -hmm. that could subsidize, subsidize tenants to buy bus passes or bike shares. and. I think the idea is to just spend it till it's gone. I think it could last a while. Right, a one time, yeah. 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 So, um, uh, so that's, I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does, and I think that's a novel solution. I'm just thinking for the board, how, how is that, how do you enforce something like that? How do you, how do you know that's actually happening? How do you know? So my, I paying a fine that goes not a fine, a, a fee. Accordion uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, that goes to the city that's used for something specific. It's it's specific, and this, you know, I I think it's great, but I just don't yeah. know how you. So I, I mean, what I suggested as a possible condition to get at that, because you know it is new and we haven't really done this before. However, you know if it's successful I think it might be helpful and and uh, particularly in supporting you know our burgeoning bike share <laughs> program um, as to have a specific condition that states that you know before they get a certificate of occupancy they have to show proof that they've made um, they've purchased um, you know bus passes or that they've purchased um, whatever that if it's bus pass or bike share so then you have the receipts for the fact that they bought these and they're going to give them to their tenants or offer them to their tenants and then we'll see the value of that do we have bike share in place yet though no, we don't today's have, thursday tomorrow we are <laughs> picking oh, okay. a vendor <laughs> so then it would be some someone would just have to decide what portion of that eight thousand would be spent on bike share membership versus transit right. pass and then kind of dole it out to new tenants as Right. right, so what, um, or you could buy certain, so let's take bike share for example. That's, um, we're hoping will be up and running next summer. Yeah. Um, and we'll know how much those passes are gonna cost. Right. Um, so, you know, um, and there'll be annual membership. So they could buy X number of passes at that value right. and then their purchase so that, um, I don't know if that, does that yeah. answer you? No, that makes sense. I mean, the, my one follow-up question. So in the SRO model, um, is it is it a lease? Like, is someone expecting to be there for a year, or is it a month-to-month -month situation, or, you know? Yeah. Typically, tenants will sign a year lease. Oh, okay. Um, and when we look at this particular SRO building, we it's a pretty big range uh -huh. of. Uh, you have some people that have been there for years. Somebody's been there about 20 years. Yeah. But not, time I see not the it tells me he's about to no, move. No, it's not. It's <laughs> month at a time and no. then someone moving on. And but like then there are plenty of people for whom this is kind of the bottom rung of the housing ladder. Mm -hmm. They're coming out of a bad situation, divorce, mm -hmm. detox, something, mm -hmm. and they're, this is their safe harbor. Mm -hmm. And then their goal is, you know, six months, eight months, a year to actually move into, you know, a, a real apartment, a larger mm -hmm. apartment. So, you know, once these uh, become efficiencies, uh, we may see the bell curve may be that people stay a little bit longer because it's a more livable mm -hmm. situation. So annual membership would be work for someone's housing situation. Yeah. And the only part of that would be low income or houses at work. I think I was reading here uh, how many units would be dedicated for the compromise of the low income or there's yeah. something like that. Yeah. What is it? So what we're what we're hoping, and this is this is predicated on raising 
mm -hmm. gobs of money from state and federal sources, but that 16 of these units would be targeted to people earning 30% of the area median in income or less, and that's kind of your lowest standard. Yeah. And we'd be looking to have subsidy, rental subsidies in those units. Mm -hmm. So if you moved in and you made, you know, $1,000 a month, you'd be looking to pay a third of that for rent. Yeah. Um, for the balance of the units, we were looking at a mix of 50% restricted and 60% restricted units. Um, so it's a range, but it's all pretty much on the, the lower end of so the So utilizing the, the standard federal model of 30% of for housing and... Yep. Okay. So HUD, HUD calculates it. It changes every year what that number is. Um, and it floats with the median income, which in the case of Northampton tends to be a little lower than you might think because you're in the Springfield MSA, so it's not just Northampton. Yes. Just to follow up on the bus bike sharing program, just playing devil's advocate, the, the worst thing, I think if, if we said a condition was before occupancy, you've got to show that you've making this up, bought 10 bus passes. Mm -hmm. And so we have proof, here's the receipt. Well, the worst thing would be have 10 annual memberships for a bus pass and only have five tenants who are going to use it, and then you're wasting, that would be the worst thing that right. could happen. So how, how could you structure it so that they're only given out to people who are actually going to use them, when they're going to use them, so they don't waste money, so right. it, you get the most benefit from it, but then it gets convoluted how to enforce it, and I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I feel confident we can work with the city to, to meet the objectives that we can put some kind of checks and balances in place. The yeah. city's going to have a deed restriction. We're going to be doing some reporting. So I think there are a number of ways. I don't. To I don't question that. I'm just. Think, I'm wondering, as a as a yeah. as a board, how do we make that a condition that it it's going to be effectively managed? Yeah, and, and I uh, I would add another I guess devil's advocate question, which would be which would be if so someone were to appear before us and say, be in a circumstance with the traffic mitigation, they could they come back and say, well you did this kind of temporary or, or, you know, thing that disappears, so to speak, when these are used up, that's gone, that $8,000 is gone. But if you're making me invest in something, traffic, whatever, that's permanent, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, you know, could that, I mean, I, mean I, I don't know if there any of that discussion has come up, but I mean, if I was on the other side of the podium and it was to my advantage, I might make that point like, well, wait a minute, you let these folks do kind of a temporary thing, but you made me, do this, you know, contribute to something that's going to be, I, I don't know, I just, yeah. it, or I, I think same with Mark, it just, it's a precedent that feel, just feels a little bit, where could this go? Right. <laughs> it seems like a really good I thing, but I think it's well it, intended. But, yeah, but it could have come back. Be, yeah. It could be a good precedent that other people follow, but you won't want people to take advantage of it. Right, I guess that's my only, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, the idea is to offset those automobile trips. Yeah. So I think that in some cases, yes, you, in some cases it, it might not make sense because there's not going to be a population or the location isn't right for busing, you know, for uh, mass transit or maybe even bike share. Um, All of I which exist in this particular circle. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So right. I think that that's where it makes sense for you to evaluate, is this even a feasible alternative? Um, and so you're right, it may be temporary, but it may also be, you know, if for a year someone gets hooked on right. yeah. taking the bus right. or the bike, Absolutely. Right. they might sign up for that second year, third year, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So in terms of how easy it is, if they recognize that this is feasible and not sort of pie in the sky, then, then the cost benefit of not having an automobile under those circumstances would be. Yeah. And, and by its very nature, the nature of the, the idealized consumer fits, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I mean, it fits this type of, of yeah. this bike or bus solution, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, not to hang on this, but I, I get all that and I agree with all that, but how do we make that a condition that's less than three pages long? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, do we, can we just put it up to the applicant in the city to figure it out yeah. and well, to demonstrate that it is being figured out over you a certain can, period of time? Yeah, I mean, what you can say is that, you know, I'd recommend that it's sometime after certificate of occupancy. That's always the way it's written for all of your trip because that's when the impact will be right. felt. Um, and you could say, you know, to the, they've met the standard in the zoning to the satisfaction of the city by, you know, showing that they've purchased X number of 
passes or what have you. They could also come back and say, you know what, we decided we're going to um, put money into modifying this intersection or putting, striping something else. So, But taking that example, say you say at yearly intervals you have to demonstrate you bought passes off of, and you're working off this yeah, threshold yeah. or something. Yeah. I follow that, but who, whose purview is that? Is that does yeah. Louis have to knock on their door and say, show me your bus passes? Right. or who, Well, I mean, you could also then put in an annual, you know, if for annually until you've reached your amount, you need to submit reporting. And then that way, it's not, the, the burden isn't on the city right. to go and knock on That's the door. That's right. So yes, I mean, and if you've done that in other, so there have been instances where the board has required um, a phasing of mitigation. Right. So Sorry. after, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so after two years, you know, pay this much after the fifth year. Right. Um, so, and, and and also reporting. So you could tag the reporting piece on too until, you know, and you could say annually until you've met your mitigation. Just submit total. A, yeah. 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 And it could be submitted to the planning office. Right. And it, I mean, it doesn't have to be complicated. It could just be a letter saying, right, right. You know, here's our, you know, on this check or whatever. Okay. So you just put your get in the schedule, right? Pretty much so. That's, I just want to, yeah. yeah. this yeah. is going to be the okay. first step of right. potentially could be utilized somewhere else right. to make it yeah. not, uh, not unduly burdensome on the city, but something that can work for the applicant and everybody wins. But there is monitoring. You know, right. There's some, yeah. there's some formality. I agree. Yeah, I think that's. So you could do annually from the, starting from the date of CO. Until the fund ex until that the fund is exhausted. Yeah. Okay. Other comments, questions from the board. Can you tell me what you think the time frame is, given that there's an awful lot of money that has to be found in order to do this? Yeah. Um, what we plan to do, assuming we have some kind of zoning permit this fall, we would be applying for state funds um, spring of 2018. Uh, we would expect to get rejected because the queue is long for funding. We would expect to reapply in 2019 and have a good chance of getting funded. Um, so you look at really construction in 2020. So it's it's a long it's a long haul. <laughs> yeah. and, the, and the people are still living in these units and stuff. Yeah. And when the, when the construction and you be relocated to yes. someplace else, right? Yes. So, that's yeah. part of your budget for it, right? It is part of the development budget to relocate folks, and it's a requirement when you work with federal funds. Um, so we're anticipating a nine-month construction on this building. It's it's a gut, so everybody goes. Um, and we would have someone who we'd hire just to work with tenants to relocate them so people get moving costs paid, they get help finding the new unit, and they get the incremental cost difference between the old unit and the uni new unit paid for them. And then they have the right to return once the units are, are ready. But easier said than done, but yes. yeah. It'll, it'll, um, I had met with the tenants on site, it was one of the first meetings I had because I thought people might be anxious about this idea that they would need to be relocated. Sometimes people start looking right away and this project is years from now, so I wanted to, and the response I got was very different than the response I expected. People were like, when is it gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's gonna be years from now. So tenants, um, the, the needs there are, are pressing, um, so people were on board. Other questions, comments from the board? anyone like to close the public hearing um, last question just on, on tree removal tree replacement um, since we can't trees are coming down that can't be replanted similar to the first applicant um, has that been reconciled with the applicant as far as money going into the tree fund or yeah, so let me actually go through the DPW comments because DPW asked for a condition to be included that um, relates to that, um, you know, finalizing that list and having them approve it. So um, they, sorry. Oh. So I don't know, Caroline, if they saw our response we had revised the number of trees coming down. Yeah. We originally had two significant trees coming down and DPW and other people looked at the plan and there's some trees really close to the new foundation and then they were like, 
come on guys, <laughs> these trees aren't gonna make it. Right. So it was revised upward to the four trees. And we, we sent that in in our comments. It's a $16,000 estimated fee that we would pay. And I'm not sure if the DPW saw that revised language that we had submitted. Yeah. It, it seemed like maybe they just didn't see that. Um, I don't know, but that's also one of the things that I think they might want to look at in more detail so we can um, so there you saw the comments that came back yep. about finalizing that yep. and I think that could be part of that um, discussion um, so let me just make a note of this too I don't think that needs to be in the condition the value um, but uh, let's just see here um, sorry So they, DPW um, wanted sort of revised plans showing the additional trees to be removed and a new calculation for the reimbursement of all trees removed. And that, their comments just came in today, so I'm thinking they didn't see that. Um, and, um, and that the um, applicant shall submit an alternate maintenance and tree protection plan submitted by a certified arborist for review and approval by the tree warden prior to the issuance of any city demolition or construction permits. And I think um, Carlos spoke to that too, that they were gonna get their arborist on. So if you included that as a, as a permit condition, and at, you know they sp specify at a minimum, the plan should include tree protection details conforming to the ANSI 300 standards part five, um, protecting the 40-inch elm and 24-inch apple would set the entrance of the driveway, um, and that the contract, the tree protection plan, shall be included in the contract documents and graphic details in the final construction drawings. And that's just obviously so the contractor who's doing the work sees what um, what that is. Um, they also had um, stormwater comments about. Um, 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 developing the, the maintenance and inspection program and that they um, get assigned a maintenance agreement prior to construction um, uh, of the project and um, they needed some more details about drain connections um, so they want those on the final plans for yard drains water and sewer line connections and um, Finally, let me just make sure. And then there was a note in there about um, the Bridge Street was just paved, so there's a five year moratorium. So if they plan to construct within that five year moratorium, they want the construction plans to reflect that they're going to have to um, repave much farther beyond that cut into the street. Um, and they also had a comment, and I don't know if the applicant talked about um, about their concern with um, the trash truck um, not being able to back out. Um, it was really more of a note that it's sort of like the existing conditions, but um, they, were, they weren't recommending any conditions related to that. Um, and that's about it. Just made me think of a dump truck coming in and not being able to back out. What about snow removal? Um, is, that, is there a similar issue with where's the snow going to go? If um, so, is there a, a plan removal? Yeah, we have identified on the plan. Um, didn't you suggest one less parking place so that there was one more space for? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't so think on they. This plan it's showing um, snow snow storage basically left next to the bike rack, and then also some snow storage kind of in the front of the property. Um, it's better than some sites we're working on in terms of places to push snow. You know, can the plow truck, if it's just a pickup truck, make that turn and, and get out? I think they probably can, but. So the DPW is, o is okay with that aspect of the plan as far as snow removal? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, sort of sites downtown are all pretty tight that way. There was one question that I had sent to Lori and sent to you as well about that parking space in the front, and is that still on the plan? No, it's been a Okay. So we came in, the original plan had 15 parking spaces, um, 
and we took one away. We only needed 14 to meet zoning. Um, so there was one that went even closer to Bridge Street. That one was lopped off. Um, so it'll look nicer, and it gives a little more space to pile some snow. I mean, in, in some <clears throat> other hearings we've had, if, if the parking spaces could, can't be maintained, then the snow has to be removed. It can't just be, can't use the parking spaces to push snow. Um, is that something we want to consider, or is downtown a unique area? <laughs> well, I mean, I think this site is sort of, um, you know, it's in their best interest if they need those parking spaces to keep them open because there's not really any other option. I mean, there's a little bit of on-street parking, but again, if it's a snow emergency, you can't do that. So they're not going to have, you know, it's, um, there's no place, there's no spillover impact on abutting neighbors. Right. So I think that it's, um, they will find a way to work that out. Just by the nature of the site. Yeah. Yeah. Comments from the board? Okay. Uh, Thank you. Move to close public comment. Second. Second. Mark and Ted. Any other discussion from the board? I, I think it's a home run. I think it's a, yeah. it's oh, yeah. a, it's a great project. It's, a great project. it's well thought out. It's, there's not, much downside at all that I can see um, and I'm curious how this just because it's new if, if this bike chair bus mm -hmm. thing works then it might be mm -hmm. great president well, yeah. yeah and I think there we'll have a chance to even think a little bit more critically in future projects about there may even be other things other than bus passes but you know another way of mitigating traffic is actually buying bicycles that, right. that are an amenity to a development and you know things like that that you kind of well, and I, I appreciate I appreciate the conversation apparently that took place about okay, what can we start with as a, <coughs> sort of a yeah. structure, and then how can we help that structure? This is what we're you know the general. This is what we're trying to accomplish. How can we do that in this somewhat unique yeah, situation? It's great. This is great. So we're making that a case study. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 motion. Or you want me to do it? Yes. Oh, you can. Well, I did the first one. I don't want to hog it. on a roll. Keep Go ahead. You guys right. are good at this. <laughs> I don't know that I got all the conditions, but we'll, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, if you want, I can read through the ones that I had noted from DPW that I had already put in here. Or well, I have those three, and I have the five year moratorium. Can I just say, uh, and other DPW comments as noted? Well, or, or you could just say uh, the, the um, DPW connection requirements. In, um, Uh, motion to approve 40R for uh, renovation of unit at 82 Bridge Street, uh, renovation of 15 units in addition of 16 units, 82 Bridge Street, map ID 32A-178 with the following conditions, um, that a maintenance plan for the stormwater system be finalized, approved by staff, recorded at the Registry of Deeds, that applicant provide final documentation of tree removal and means of addressing replacement, um, that plans be revised to incorporate changes in details for tree protection, stormwater, and bike shelters. Uh, that Bridge Street repaving, if it occurs within the current five-year moratorium, be in accordance with paving requirements per DPW. Um, that the DPW connection requirement water and sewer. for water and sewer be abided by. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, basically, Final plan show. Final plan show the compliance with DPW connection standards. Uh, and finally, um, prior to certificate of occupancy, applicant will submit proof of purchase of transit passes for residents equaling the required traffic mitigation amount and an annual report filed starting the date of the certificate of occupancy um, until the fund is exhausted. That's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good project. Mm, this is terrific. So, I see the kind of the break. What's that? It's here. Uh, Kel, do you need the? I took my pen drive off. But your presentation is on your desk. Oh, that would be great if I could. Do you want to leave it there? Yeah. Perfect. Thank I'll just leave you. it there. 
Can we just uh, so the probably, you know, yeah. people who are going to be eligible to live in this development. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. In the so we better. Yeah, and that was the other thing. I mean, people, I mean, I've had guys working for me. It's free. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what it's so like. It may be that, you know. Yeah. That, that fund could, could serve. Over, over a long time. Yeah. Lots, yeah. lots of people, yeah. And so maybe yeah. there's more substantial yeah. improvement. As part of the bike, like, purchasing the big locks, yeah. too. Bike share program? Yeah. Um, if, the, if the board so, is so oriented, I'd just like to make one suggestion on the agenda. We have a couple of people here. here for, I have, I'm thinking for two different items. I think one gentleman's been here since the beginning. <laughs> but uh, okay, but do, but I understand that you might be interested just in one of the zoning issues. So I was going to suggest that we address that, then close, then address the other person that's here, and then you guys can go and we can stay here till midnight if that's what you. <laughs> so I just not. I hate for you to have to stay just while we go through this other thing. Okay. All right. Well then, if if that's okay, then then we can address um, uh, the item that's an addition about the tree replacement removal from Hinkley Trace. So I think the folks at Social Security think that I'm tech savvy, <laughs> but that's an illusion. That, um, Are you asking for help? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a code for? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I was waiting for that. <coughs> it was very gracious. Um, so, well, the computer's not that great, and there are all these cables okay. in, the, in the way. <laughs> See, they put the lock on the right. That's the problem. It's not you, it's... it's yeah. Oh, way down there. Yeah. See what I can find that. See what's... I know I've seen it. Um, I'm using the first time. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With your mouse, we haven't, we haven't gone to touch screen yet. I know. Now that my kids have taught me to use an iPhone, I'm hopeless. So, thank you for a brief moment here. Um, I'm going to just walk you through a little refreshment <coughs> on this particular side. This is Hinkley Trace, which right. came to you as 121 Hinkley Street. It's 115 to 129, eight uh, homes. <coughs> this is really just um, a, a reminder of the success story. This is 11.40 a.m. on the 21st of June, which is the summer solstice. And if you'll look at that, you'll see the, the shading line for protection of the glazing sitting right spot on the bottom of the glazing. This is what you want to look for in terms of sustainability in buildings. The, uh, the summer shading protects all the south glass from insulation, okay. So it's a, it's a, it's an important part of reducing cooling loads and creating comfort. And this shading is, is, in many ways more important than uh, some aspects of uh, tree shading, because it protects the building from overheating. Okay. So let's see here. Mm. My forward button. This particular building um, is, so the, the project was modeled on 15% uh, shading from, from uh, uh, trees and was designed around that. This particular building on the northeast corner, in fact, has this shading from uh, one of the trees on the site and an adjacent tree, which really makes the unit, which is to the right of my cursor here, um, uh, impossible to achieve uh, solar um, electric, which is what is dependent upon for for zero. Um, not doing net zero over 40 years on this project, and uh, the, the SunPower 360 system will produce for 60 years, is a net carbon load of 556,000 pounds. 
So this is the plan, and it is this building here, and it is this tree, which is which is causing those um, that shading. And and uh, Hinkley Street is on the left there. Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, just orienting my. Yes, uh, after all this time in here, we still all stand on our heads and you know, say, which way is Hinkley Street? Luckily, you have required that one of the buildings face the street, so we always we always orient to that. Otherwise, we get confused. This is just a reminder of, of the extent of the planting that was uh, proposed, um, not required, but definitely part of the, the scheme for the project. And uh, going back to the Berkshire plan. Planting, so very extensively planting. Um, we didn't didn't come to this observation till the trees came out this spring and and uh, started to wander through this process. And uh, <coughs> my wife and I are developers uh, in, in, for New Harmony Properties, and we have committed to providing these people solar access. Uh, that is a necessary part of sustainability. And indeed, we've restricted. Uh, who they can use and what they can use. We provided access to the Clean Energy Center financing at uh, below market rates and outside of the loan to value. So what we have here is um, a tree that's 30 inches at the appropriate height and it needs to come down. Um, that's <coughs> 15 inches, which is uh, five three inch trees, which is worth about $3,000. Did that come back from from Rick is Rich Parcelletti is being yeah he agree, he um, felt that was that value was um, accurate yeah okay yeah. so it's about three thousand dollars and we can certainly do that what we're asking the board to uh, uh, um, uh, allow staff to do is allow us to divvy that up the the the, the landscape architects Jeff Squires from Berkshire Design is a is a uh, Cape Cod native and he goes native for a couple of weeks in the summer, including this week. And it's great, but I don't have input from him as if, it, it, is there any place on the plan where we could put these trees and not, not face uh, the, uh, you know, a, a, a shading problem later? The neighbor on this side would like more evergreens, so just put that into the board's consideration. It doesn't provide shade in the sense that you, you're looking for from shade trees, um, I would love to put some, uh, we're going to put some material here for her benefit um, uh, as, a, as a neighborhood courtesy. Um, so the, the goal here would be to have your blessing on working on some split. If we can find to do them on, on site reasonably, we'd like to do that. If not, we'll pay into the fund at the, the rate we've suggested. And uh, um, <coughs> I think that that's the basis of any commentary here, we're happy to comply. It's just a quandary that we face in the development business and in our community as to how we balance these uh, these uh, needs. And, and of course, Carolyn raised the very appropriate point. You know, well, what's the carbon value of the tree that's there? And it depends if it's replanted. You know, um, carbon is sequestered in timber if you harvest it and replant it. But the replanting becomes incredibly important, which is why forest stewardship is, is, a, is a big deal. So there are no slam dunk answers there. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, if, you, if you read the Gazette and places like that, I'm a big fan of trees and what they do in producing oxygen, otherwise we would suffocate. What will be, I'm trying to, so what's, I guess that's to the south. Right. If that tree comes out. Yes. That one? Yeah. Yes, there's another one right across the property line that we don't have any control over. Okay. So for a butters or people viewing it from that direction, obviously a very significant tree is going to be gone, but are there, I mean, where's the next? Oh, there, there, there's, there's tree cover uh, back in this whole area. There's another locust uh, or shag bark uh, right, right in that same vicinity. It's just over the property line. Mm -hmm. But the, the angle of, as we, near as we can tell, we, the angle uh, uh, improves the solar gain. So we modeled this on 15% so, uh, coverage from, from tree, tree interference, if you will. This unit has about 20. 
this has about 12, this has about nine, this has about 17. So you know, it's all there. So actually the, the, the tree shading that's most important is west. That's where the heat comes from. And so we're at the bottom of a hill here. We, we got lots of, uh, we've got lots of, of uh, upslope shading here. It's not clear to us uh, <coughs> when, when this road reconstruction, which is, which is happening now, which is, which is wonderful, exactly what's gonna come out. There's some protected trees. There's gonna be some more tree planting. We'd love to see if, if our trees could fit into increasing that. You know, 20 years ago, there was no Arbor program in Northampton. And what, we, what you have now is an incredibly um, uh, advanced and astute awareness of the interplay between these things, which is great. And I have to say that sitting here with this last presentation, I was just sort of enjoying the wafting up of civil discussion about important stuff. You know, it's really great what you do and what you sponsor here. And we're very lucky to have this. So I don't have any, this is not, I'm not asking for any deference on any item. I'm just here to say we want to make this shift and we'd like to negotiate that with Carolyn and the DPW on that topic. So, yes, ma'am. Um, the tree that's going down, yes. how much more sun is being added when that tree goes down? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, I wish we had the ability to, to snip it out. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, in terms of the shading, I've talked yeah, about because I mean it's a it's a fair distance away as these things go, and I know there's a slant there, and I'm trying to understand the double slant and how far that sure you know how far that gives it. So the tree that you're seeing on this picture yeah. is is irrelevant. That's cool. a, the, the the shading is what I wanted to show you, which right. is the which is the uh, the locust and hickory, and as you know, locusts in the city grow very tall. We had some in our house in Florence that grew to 145 feet, and they were unbelievably tall. Do you uh, anticipate that all of that shadow is going to be gone? No, but what we're going to find is we're going to see some penetration to the solar in the summer by around 10:30 in the morning, and that will, as the leaves fall, we'll get some portion of that. So, right. so, and 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 we lose it in the winter by about 3.30, 3.45 in the depth of winter. So we gotta get some of that curve uh, into the mix. And let me just clarify. So the reason why Jonathan's back here is because it's just a modification of the site plan. You didn't see that this tree was coming out. So mm -hmm. uh, again, sort of a change in, in midstream. So uh, I posted it as a minor amendment. I did the same thing of trying to notify some of the abutters so they knew this was coming. Um, um, and that that's why they're, they're here. So just that one tree. Thank you for that clarification. That's what we got. But, um, you know, this, this uh, 15 degrees uh, from horizontal to the shade angle is something that I learned from uh, some sustainability folks in 1975, and it's the Earth is still organized the same way. <laughs> The magnetic field has shifted slightly, but this is pretty much the same. And that shade is caused by just a slightly increased we have a roof 31 line. inch. It's 31 inch overhang uh, to the drip line, and that's it was calculated based on that, and which is cool when you know when the when the numbers work out. <laughs> um, you know, like the measurements with your kid on the on the door of the bathroom, <laughs> like you know, five foot one or four foot three. It was like, wow, there it is. That's the story. And you know, if every house in America had been built this way since 1953, we would never, ever have had to build a nuclear power plant. Just turn them in the right direction and shade the South Class. That's all we had to do. I mean, sustainability has been at our fingertips for the entire development of the human race. And in the last four generations, we have turned the other way. It is really time to, as we have begun, to re-embrace this as normal, as not something that is uh, optional or just for people with resources. This is easy. This is really easy. So I've been teaching about this, uh, providing workshops. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty straightforward. If you do nothing else, just point it in the right direction. <laughs> so. uh, questions, comments yes, from the Excuse board? Me. Yes, Mark. Carolyn, you said you tried to get a hold of as many abutters as you could. What 
informed that well, I just emailed I mean again it's not we didn't we're, I didn't mail out notice because it's not officially a full-blown amendment and it's just a I mean I would call it a minor change but you know there was a lot of discussion about this permit so right. um, I wanted to make sure at least some people so with the emails that I had I sent to a couple of the abutters and I asked them please notify your friends <laughs> about this that was like three weeks ago but I never got a response back um, truthfully I'm, I'm struggling a bit with this because <clears throat> there was a lot of pushback on this development that some people thought in the, the abutters thought it was too much didn't didn't disagree with it in in format other than there was too many two would have been better than four and now we're taking that a step further one could argue if you're in a butter and saying in an argument to get sustainable design which we can't get unless we chop down this big tree which goes against sustainable design so and that might be an argument that an abutter might had if adequate notice was they given understood. or they had. It may, it's the summer season, maybe people are at the Cape or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I don't necessarily, I can see that argument. I'm not advocating that that's, but, but with the level of pushback that this particular development had, I, it seems like somebody from the, from the abutters should, would be here if they, you know, and so I'm, I'm struggling a bit with, with addressing this as a minor site change. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, it was a very long uh, hearing, I think more than one, actually, if I recall correctly. Um, and, and I agree. I know this is, um, might not be seen as being very objective, but um, what kind of interactions or response or have you had any with the abutters since the project actually began? Well, let me be frank with you. Um, the project came in compliant and um, frankly in every way suitable and providing leadership in sustainability and affordability for the city of Northampton. Um, my attorney remarked that it was the ugliest public hearing in his experience in 26 years. I would say that less than 2% of the comments were appropriate to the project and to the conditions that were being addressed. So it was, I would consider it a public flogging, and I would consider that the resistance has nothing to do with the merits of the project. It has to do with other issues that are social in the city and uh, related to last fall's election. So with all respect, I would say it's very minor, and I can leave it there, and in five years they'll take it down and you'll have no, and it will not cost me $3,000. Try to do the right thing. and. Frankly, that evening was a bullying session uh, in public, and I think it uh, doesn't uh, serve the public interest. So that was my experience um, that evening. And uh, if they want to come, they can. This affects the neighbors not at all. It's not, their, it's not their tree. It doesn't affect their shade. It's a few less leaves that will blow into the neighbor's property to the east. Um, really hardly noticeable. Um, those are my, my thoughts about that. I'm happy to, you know, to leave it alone and, and let, the, let the buyer deal with it later. I just feel like it's a, a good thing to consider, at least at this point. I think just to follow up on that, that it is on that um, back lot line as opposed to the side lot lines right. where some of the other houses are closer. So um, I think that's another reason why I put it in front of you as a minor amendment as opposed to saying, okay, this really affects, you know, two people or three people or whatever the number is. We've had great relations with the neighborhoods during construction. We've had zero uh, um, uh, runoff, never mind historic blowouts, never mind any of that. So the stormwater during construction has been great. So they're going to see a, a, a real improvement, continuing improvement in the stormwater in the neighborhood. And it takes some getting used to, uh, certainly. This unit down here has, uh, there's some pine trees here. Um, we've, we've called her Betty. I'm not sure her name is Betty, but her, she has become Betty. And uh, she's been very friendly. And, and, uh, so, and we'll meet with Laura Norris, who lives over here, who's a longtime friend of ours, and see if we can find a way to fill in some, some evergreens in here. It really has to be textured as part of construction there because it was an enormous boulder that we moved over here. It's about seven and a half feet in diameter. 
So there's a little, we've kept some of that, we've moved some things around. <coughs> we do have uh, uh, some opportunities there, but you know, I think the, the, the ordinance is, is good and we're happy to make those. I just hope the trees get planted soon because if the tree comes down to make the carbon piece work, they need to, they need to grow back um, as soon as possible. Any other comments from the board? Uh, I, I think there is a concern that the public meeting hearing, I think we should, I don't know, clear that out because there is that concern. From what he presented, I, I, I see no problem, but then there is a something that happened before, then you have to see how, how they are good as they. Well, I, I guess I would suggest that, you know, would it make a difference if they had come in originally and said, um, added one more tree to the list of trees that had mm -hmm. to be removed for the project? So that's really what you're, you know, you approve the site plan with a, a lot of changes to the site. This is at the back of the site, and it's just one they didn't, they forgot to include or they just didn't realize that it was going to have an impact because they were trying to, you know, mm -hmm. minimize the total clearing that was done. Um, and so I, I think you need to look at it in that context, not necessarily how many people can show up to say they don't want another yeah. tree to come down. Um, and, you know, I when um, Jonathan first presented the fact that he wanted to take a tree down, I said, please show what that impact is so that it's clear. And so I think the picture of the shading of the roof sort of does that. It's not, there's not an interest to just clear more trees. It, there, there's a purpose to it. So you approve this being a net zero project. So if this is necessary in order to get to that, um, and it, I would still argue it's a minor adjustment and even if, one of the abutters did come and say, oh, I don't want another tree to come down. Would, you know, I guess you have to think about it in that context. Would that sway you to say, oh, okay, we're not going to approve it? I don't know. I would argue that a little bit in that we didn't approve it as a net zero project. We approved the development, which happened to be a net zero project, and now the applicant's saying it can't be a net zero unless you chop down this tree. And so I just, with the, with the, a nerve was certainly touched during that presentation, whether the comments were adequate or not, a nerve was struck. And I'm just wondering if collectively we pass this and, and, and people feel adequate notice wasn't given on the heels of the, the preceding hearing. Um, for the sake of a month, I'm just wondering if, if we just push this to September, gave adequate notice. If it's approved in September, it's still planting season or cut down season, um, and we just we just do things by you know just give adequate notice. If nobody shows up, that's great. No harm, no foul. What's adequate notice? Well, just other than like a like a, a formal like notice a to the abutters system. versus. So that's where the, I mean that's where I'd be concerned because so we've established this. Um, these sort of benchmarks or thresholds for for when things are staff approval, when they come before you on a posted agenda versus when there's a full-blown amendment. And if we start mailing out notices that aren't really for a full-blown amendment, then the we're sort of parallel as well. Yeah. We're saying yeah. now we have to notify everybody of every That's right. Yeah, so that the, this, like an amendment would be like a new, like a categorically different, yeah. right. you know, condition or something that you know if it's a a math difference then that that seems to me to fall into the category of minor that we've discussed in the past you know that it, yeah. it it's sort of like Cumberland Farms yeah, yeah and I guess uh, uh, Carolyn I think your point you know okay if it was originally part of the project would it you know would it have changed our vote if if it's brought before you now would it be a you know or would we would we be kind of changing precedent a little bit just for the sake of, you know, something that may or may not actually change our, um, and I don't, I don't know, um, Jonathan, how many trees have come down. I mean, it's, it is one more tree. It is a very large tree, and which will, of course, and uh, as you pointed out, the somewhat 
paradoxical we're gonna take down a tree to do <laughs> I mean there you know that part I'm sure if someone wants to will be thrown uh, back I, I, I certainly I you know I, I agree because yeah it was a very two very heated meetings I think you were asked to refuse it I mean mm -hmm. there was a lot that went on um, but I guess I wouldn't I don't know that it would change you know we approved this project. Something has come up during the implementation of the project. I, I, you know, I guess I, I don't see what would change right. whatever decision we already made. That's a project because I had approved, right? I mean, it's not right. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, are we going to? I mean, is there something that's going to happen that we're going to say no? You can't do this. I mean, I, I guess that's the yeah. point. Right. But but it's yeah. I, I we certainly are opening that possibility that someone might come and say, hey, wait a minute. This isn't what you said, and you didn't give me. Well, so and just sort of back on the adequate notice piece, um, I emailed three weeks ago. So even if someone had been on vacation, then I mean maybe they're on vacation for the whole summer. So I'm not going to three times. Five months ago, you know. <laughs> if I could be on vacation yeah. for that time, <laughs> I would be. Right. But I'd probably also be checking my email right. and right. sending. Right. Right. Um, you know, mad notice to everybody and letters saying this is the worst thing since sliced bread. Right. You know, it didn't generate anything. Anything. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman says that your neighbor, yes, you know, one, two, or three mentioned three different neighbors. Yes. Yeah. So, did they receive that? I didn't have emails. So for that's those yeah, that's my so, point. So, so I'm gonna well, just to remind the board gently that the. Neighbors do not have up or down authority over a project. Oh, yeah. right. The authority rests with the board for compliance. Oh. This project was compliant from day one. So the comments of the neighbors, though vociferous, could be addressed to very specific items. Stormwater, uh, which was addressed, it's better than it was, and to neighborhood character. The neighborhood character discussion has been had ad infinitum for eight months. They're built. So there's really, this tree is not a vote item of the neighborhood. They could come, frankly, by the thousands, and it makes no difference. This is a, an exchange of one tree for other trees that's part of the city ordinance. It's a bylaw. It exists. It's a right, actually, for the developer to do this. It's a courtesy to have the discussion, mm -hmm. but it's part of the calculus that we do. The I hearing initially there. was a site I'm, plan. I'm not dying to spend $3,000 at this point mm. to do this, but I, I think it's the right thing to do. Um, there are eight, unit, uh, eight units, right? No. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Eight. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So a special it was, it, permit. It was a special permit right. hearing, but this not, was not the, a site plan. Right. Right. But the site plan. I mean, this was a site. The special permit was for the eight units. Right. Right. The site plan. It was also a site plan. So this is a minor mo modification of the site plan. Right. Okay. But the argument wasn't. That's a little disingenuous in that it was just neighbors have no say. They have a say in the special permit discussion, and that's what that was based not on logistics well, or site uh, plan and so forth. Um, eight units are allowed by right. I'm sorry? Eight units are allowed by right. I know, but it was a special, special permit. permit hearing. Special permit yeah. is more yeah, than six units. Because of the, because of the site community. plan that, that so it's, it's a six units. Uh, but the issue of density was by right. Right. Mm -hmm. You could have had an awful project there and never come to this board. Questions, comments, suggestions? Action. I'm comfortable considering it a minor, uh, you know, I, it I doesn't, I am too. It's, um, yeah, I, I don't see this as being something that would require reopening any kind of a hearing. Um, just for, I'm not, so I just want to make sure that we have the votes for, or everybody knows where I stand on it. I, w I would, I would be with Tess. I, I think I would, you know, at this point, uh, I would agree with it. It's, you know, it's a, it's not a significant. Maybe we need a vote so that it's yep. decisive. Yep. Motion to approve minor modification to site plan for Hinkley Trace. Um, I don't have the address in front of me. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Not ID. <laughs> 
the address, John? <laughs> um, sorry. One, oh, 115 to 129. That was, it hadn't been assigned until then? Uh, to allow for removal of one significant tree and adequate replacement per the city's tree replacement ordinance. Second. Opposed? Mark. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience. Of course. It's always good to see you. <laughs> um, we'll now open the 7.30 <laughs> public <laughs> hearing <laughs> okay. following proposed zoning changes. Um, <laughs> if you would like, we can, if there's a particular item you're, you have a personal interest in, so I'd be glad to address that first if you out of the list of six um. <laughs> okay are you gonna walk us through this yeah I just would need to disconnect oh. from here so that I can connect over there <laughs> Okay, so um, did you say you wanted to start with the uh, yeah, first one? Okay. I do. Can we ask a quick question on the previous item real quick? Sure. I'm just, it just popped in my head. Did you have to recuse yourself? Yeah. No. So should he have even participated in this last vote? <laughs> I, I just, well, it just popped in my head. Well, yeah, that's a good question. It just popped mm -hmm. into my head, but I didn't even think about it till I just, yeah. Yeah. Till, yeah um, I don't know, but yeah, it wouldn't have made. I mean, it wouldn't have made a difference. But yeah, I right. just think that may be brought up. Yeah. yeah, I didn't even think about that. But I don't know what the parliament. Right. Yeah. Pr are. Well, because if you'd done that initially, yeah, right. um, then it would make sense to carry yeah, forward. Forward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we. Well, let's flog him later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's covered. He always makes it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All of us are in. <laughs> okay. okay. I'll sleep well tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, let me just, um, whoops, I'm just trying to find this. Okay. Really, yeah. <laughs> it didn't take any time at all. I'm a little bit used to talk all the time. Yeah. Mm. 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 Just right in the majority, because mm. I didn't experience. Mm. But that was something that you know. See what that was? Oh, yeah. Did you? <laughs> yes, I was. You decided to yes, it was. Yeah. 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 Have you been over there? Have mm. you seen it? Well, it, it just changes the nature of the look in the area. Tell me I'm not going to be able to pull it up. Yeah, but. Yeah, well, um, that's right. I do. Well, while this is coming, I mean, we can go ahead and start. Do you have copies of the ordinance? I have a couple of extra copies if anybody needs a packet. Could I get a copy? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to keep this. That's the whole thing. Um, let me make sure I still have mine up here so I can review. Oh, yeah, I do. Okay, Does yeah, anybody yeah. else need? I guess I'll just okay. Okay. Oh, you all? I have an extra. Uh, Brahma? Um, I guess two. Okay. If you don't mind. Um, Close up. So, I don't know. Oh, my God. Yeah. For some reason. Ooh. Being uh, hard to get. So, the first item is um, a modification to the sign um, ordinance to address some changes based on. Um, some court rulings about how detailed um, temporary signs can be. How, how um, our ordinance isn't exactly content neutral. So there have been some changes ah. to um, um, be more specific about particular some of the, our temporary some temporary signage. And so we went back and looked at our ordinance to see how it was to make it mesh with um, more recent decisions. So. The first ordinance is a modification to section 357.2C, um, and it's um, 
moving all of that, which talks about temporary freestanding ground signs to a new section, and then, um, which if you drop down to the second page, also deletes um, some content, some um, text that relates to content. So it's clarifying um, 7.2C and just moving it to um, a different section, but deleting um, language that relates to signs that are for a particular cause or for, um, yeah, political signs. So, and that's because you're not supposed to be able to look at a sign and have to read it in order to determine whether it's legal or not <laughs> um, when it relates to that. So we needed to take this language out. Um, so it would read, signs shall not, you know, so then it just sort of um, um, reduces it down to looking at what's an appropriate size sign in a residential district. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the nature of this change. Signs shall not exceed three square feet and shall not, be on private property, uh, not closer than five feet to any property line. Sh signs shall not be any um, higher than four feet from the um, ground. And um, so just basically simplify it down to those. And, and so it does reduce the size, um, but we're talking about residential districts and we're talking about signs of any kind. Um, I'm thinking specifically of like right builders or, or Valley Home or somebody who, or construct those yep. oh, temporary right. sign that they're all bigger than three, three square feet isn't all that I big. Yeah. And I'm thinking of like just a home improvement person who plop, right. first things they plop that sign down and it's usually, you know, three by four or right. something like that. Right. Um, What's that? <laughs> it's I mean, not so <laughs> abbreviations only. Not even a real estate sign like a f would. Yeah, would right. Three square, three square feet, feet is feet quite small. Seems, that's not very much. Screen yeah, screen. I mean, well, three. So our there's some many of the real estate signs would meet that. There are they've there's been sort of sign creep mm -hmm. <laughs> in the size, mm -hmm. and that, I think that goes for the contractor signs too. Um, so yes, it's a valid point. We are saying six feet to three feet, but we have. Um, oh, actually, this sign, I think, is two and a half square feet. Yeah. So these are the signs we do for public notice. Yep. Um, so it can be a little bit bigger than this. Um, and it seemed, from staff perspective, that that's probably adequate for a real estate sign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know something's for sale, you can see. <laughs> So that was that was our intent from the staff side. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if there's not an agreement and you know you want to pass that along, you think six is fine or something in between. You know, we're not wedded to the size. We just we're trying to um, pick a number that would be across the board for all residential districts that wouldn't be too obtrusive mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. So How big is that sign? Yeah, that's different. Yeah. It's two and a half. So they don't need it. It's commercial. That's commercial. They just need a paper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Or is this? Is it three? So that's maybe twenty inches, eighteen inches at least by. At the place where he's building. Mm -hmm. Two. So that's a foot and a half by two. That's. Oh, that's three, then. Three and a half, three and a half by two, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So that's the size. It just seems like it would be smaller. I don't know why. Yeah. It seems plenty big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people remaking signs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's you get a, it. You get a kickback from the sign. <laughs> I was going to say, it's economic development. Yeah. <laughs> Ink will be cut off of a lot of signs. <laughs> They'll be writing and then I'll go down. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other piece of that is, again, sort of cleaning up the language and um, deleting a section in the residential um, about no more than one sign indicating meetings or existence of civic organizations, again, because it's not content neutral. Mm -hmm. So um, deleting that piece. Um, now, um, uh, there, um, actually, I should say the real estate signs in the upper pa the paragraph above. There is a specific call out for real estate signs or lease is four square feet. It was six, 
So that does give a little oh, bit more space, more okay. space for um, that. I'm sorry, I forgot about that. Um, and then a, a reduction in the setback from 10 feet to 5 feet, um, mostly because we've reduced the setbacks, the front setbacks for um, the districts to 10 feet. So. And it's four square feet for the contractor signs too. I see in the in the next paragraph. Um, Temporary sign an architect, engineer, or contractor oh, to be erected. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't catch that before. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. For everybody. For everything. So there's no discussion. Not more than four square feet. Okay. You need four? Just make it four for everybody. Okay. So I don't know how you want to do it. If you want to go through these, make a motion for recommending to city council, or go through the whole thing and then go back and. Can you ask one as they read them. So you need a yeah. recommendation from us for Sorry. city council, yeah, because city council is going to review have a, their public hearing on September um, 11th. Um. And do you need them for each one, or can yeah. we just do the whole bunch? Um, we, uh, each one. Okay. Well, because you might have modifications. Right. Like in this one, you have modifications, okay. so you probably want to vote on each one. So, so I, I move to recommend uh, modifications to Ordinance Chapter 350-7.2C with the revision that all signs shall not exceed four square feet. Second. All in favor? Do you have to recommend the deletion and the shifting of those as well? Uh, no, because it's, this is what was submitted okay. as okay. the ordinance change. Okay. So, quick question. So, when we make that recommendation to City Council, it's not, um, it's just they take it under advisement. Right. Yes. Yeah. yes. They bring it up and so they this, this has been recommended. Three square right. feet. Right. Or right. Yep. right. Okay. Okay. So, number two is. Um, uh, just a tweak to section 8.7, which is parking, the required off-street parking spaces for um, educational um, uses. The, so required off-street parking spaces, there was a provision that allowed for um, a special permit if you were providing parking further than, you know, either not on site but within um, um, 500 feet or 1,000 feet. And um, this is just a clarification that that doesn't apply to educational uses, um, like you know, secondary, primary, secondary, and then also colleges, because we can't require special permits for educationally exempt uses. So it's really just a cleanup um, of that. Do I have a motion? I move to recommend revisions to Ordinance 350-8.7 as amended. Second. Second by Anne. All in favor? Number three. Okay. Um, so this is the next series are all related to um, photovoltaic um, panels. Um, Section 8.9. Um, to um, allow or create a provision for um, parking lots in which um, photovoltaic canopies are proposed, so that in surface parking lots uh, with more than 75 parking spaces, an added sentence that would state that the calculation for determining whether planting strips are required does not apply to the portion and number of parking spaces that are covered by one or more of the canopies. So that's not number three. What, what number one is that? Um, 8.9F? That's four. Oh, Almost I'm sorry. That's okay. I died. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Um, as long as you know what we're doing. I had, it, I had it stapled, I guess, in the wrong order. Um, so that's so that you, you don't have to plant under <laughs> a canopy. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. Um, and then similarly, um, that you don't have to um, calculate trees um, in the area that are that's right. being covered by the canopy. Only question is, say uh, the old Honda spot, uh -huh. say Home Depot comes in, puts up their building, and you've got this massive parking lot, and they want to cover it with PV 
over the parking lot and thereby eliminate every island and a tree on the island that would have been there. Is that, I get that a tree on an island will prevent PVs in the area of the tree from working, but is there a scenario where we're, we're working against ourselves and you end up with just this, a lot of asphalt and a lot of PVs in a, you Can know, you trees. not limit the amount of PVs that are put up? Or c couldn't you, couldn't you, you say the, uh, the, the type of trees that are planted on an island, they can be small decorative trees that aren't gonna go grow huge and thereby prevent the sun from getting at the PVs, but we wouldn't actually have to eliminate those trees in their entirety, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I guess um, for, um, to take an example of any, not necessarily just that site, but let's say a site that has a large parking lot would probably be in the commercial district. We do require planting along the street a lot better buffer in the front. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, and the purposes of trees in parking lots was to break up not, not only the heat island effect, but aesthetically um, that expanse of parking. I think um, this ordinance is basically trying to encourage the use of um, photovoltaic arrays, and when you do canopies you know, over a big um, parking area, you're, you are, you know, you're preventing, yeah, you're shape. achieving sort of the, re the reduction of that potential heat island effect because of the canopy. Um, and also you're not going to necessarily see, you're going to see more than just a field of asphalt and cars. Plus, you'd have the landscaping probably on the outside, on the, along the street where the sidewalks are. So I guess that was the, I, that's I get the, the intent, idea. but I'm thinking like the, say the Walmart parking lot, the big parking lot that exists. If Walmart said, you know what, we're going to put PVs everywhere and we're also going to take away all the islands and all the trees that exist, to me that would look worse than, I think it would look you do? I mean, I'd rather, partly because the photovoltaic canopy is actually doing something. Like it's oh, I more, get, I yeah, get yeah. that. I, but to me, it's almost in the weird way, like the, the previous thing where we've got to cut down this tree that could grow over 100 feet in order to get right. the sun to hit this house. But then you're, it, you're yeah, it's I, like I cross purposes. From an aesthetic standpoint, you're still, you've still got this large expanse. Right. right. That's just a large expanse. Right, a large expanse covered with anything it's still a large, it's still a large right. expanse. Yeah. Does this, so I'm just thinking you want to break it up. Does this thing prevent, does this thing simply say if someone wants to put up, up the, the uh, sun things that they can put them up everywhere? That once they decide to use that system, they can put it up over everything and that we would have no control of it? No. No. It's still, this is still would require site plan review. It says that the number of trees per, so there's a calculation of for every parking space um, over 15, you have to plant one tree. Right. The idea was that tree would be in the right. islands in order to create shade for the parking and break that parking up. It's not saying that um, you don't have to have any landscaping and that's where your purview would come in. That the, It's just the one per 15 you could also, as part of site plan review, say you know you need parking or vegetation or trees along the edge to break up the the PV, the the expanse of the PV, if it really is that expanse. Yeah. So you still got the same. You're saying you still have the same calculation, but you don't have the you don't. Uh, it's not it's not a straight calculation of one tree for 15. So if you had 50 parking spaces, 45 parking spaces. <laughs> Um, that you want to cover for canopy, you would um, be required to plant three trees total. What this is saying is you don't have to, those 45 spaces that are under the canopy, you don't have to, par you don't have to provide the three trees that you would otherwise because we're getting a benefit of the canopy. Um, that doesn't mean you're not planting trees on the rest of the site because you might have parking elsewhere yeah, that's triggered. The perimeter. I, yeah, but that, I, that's not I guess the same. That's not the same question. If you had 150 parking spots, mm -hmm. and you simply, and you have this, the implication seems to be if somebody comes in and wants to cover the parking lot with 150 spaces worth of photovoltaic, then they can do that. 
And is that, was that really what this is saying, or could we not say, yes, you can put it on, let's just say, 75 in this, in this back part, but we want the front part to stay. I mean, I'm just asking yeah. the question about. Well, I, I could see worst case scenario is a, a row of trees in the front, a sea of asphalt that, covered by PVs, and then a store in the back. That's exactly what I'm asking, and right. it could, could, does it simply permit them to have nothing except yeah, it says where you have PVs, you yeah. don't need but trees. And I'm thinking where you don't have trees, you don't have an island. Right. And, and it, oftentimes... It may or may not be bad, but it's, it means there's no choice. There's no control. No, it says but you the don't... The question is, is that what it means? I think what it means is you don't have a planted island. There's still the pedestrian connectivity requirement, which may right. require you to have an island under the canopy. But it doesn't mean you put trees in that island because you've got the canopy. So I think the... The or it doesn't mean that you have to put trees in the island. Like they could if they. They could design it so there's a break between the yeah. canopies. But what it's saying is so you'd still potentially have to have islands for people to walk from parking space A. Potentially. To but I mean, a lot of the islands now are used for runoff. You know, they're active. They're yeah. not, it's not just a, a walkthrough. Right. And so. But to me, I'm thinking worst case scenario, it, this would allow them to eliminate all the islands and just have a painted yellow stripe where pedestrians walk. And we'd, there'd be no vegetation, no runoff, no. I, I I could see changing it so you don't need a shade tree, but you, you know, the, it could just be a, a small decorative tree that's not or something like that. I I, I'm just thinking worst case scenario, yeah, which I can't I, ever really see happening, but I wouldn't want. And I guess I would go maybe along maybe along with Mark in that. Why. Why does doing a good thing and doing the photo of a take? Yeah. mean you don't have to do that I mean to me you're going to I mean yes yeah, some people are going to do it for altruistic reasons some are going to do it because it's economically advantageous to them right and that shouldn't part of that shouldn't be that they don't have to plant the trees they would have had to plant I mean why do we change the tree requirement just because they're you know they can put trees right. somewhere else or they can go into the right. city fund and the trees well, get planted somewhere I mean but then we could also I mean, really, we should be reducing the amount of <coughs> parking that's allowed. I mean, that's like a whole other thing. Like, yeah, I just don't so, think that yeah. the tree in a planting is having that much of an impact. Yeah. Like, I don't think that it's having <coughs> that much it, of a... Yeah, but, but I, I guess... Like, I don't see... Why, why would we reduce the number of trees that need to, that are going to be required to be planted? I guess... Well, I think because the intent was going back to Heat Island effect. Sure. Like, we're talking about, like, way back when, I mean, way back when, like, 30 years ago, like... The only way that we could offset heat island effect on giant parking lots was let's plant some trees. Right. But now we know that building a canopy that creates shade that's covered with photovoltaic panels is a more effective way of offsetting that impact. And so we're saying if you're going to do this thing instead and meet that goal, then we're not going to require you to do this other thing. I mean, but, I don't know. It's but yeah. the, the array does have both an ecological and economic benefit. Right. So. Uh, and a cost, though. It's certainly far more expensive right. to put up PV canopy than to put up some trees in a little you, island. You look at, like, where the Greenfield Savings Bank is and that, that yeah. coal vest development. So I don't know how many islands with trees oh, and right, plantings yeah. are. Yeah. You take all those islands and trees and plantings away and just put PVs. Just aesthetically, you drive by King Street, which we, we've See, taken. I feel like that would look so much better. Well, I think we've taken. <laughs> like, that's what, yes, that's, what, that's what's yes. good, is that we have to. Yeah. But I think. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> <laughs> you, sort of. go, you go down King Street, and we've yeah. taken yes. such pains to have that pedestrian belt right. with the trees, and where it's coming together, I drive by and I think, this is great. This is what we're trying to do. And if right behind that, it was just yeah, PVs, that would I'd say, ah, yeah. oh, we, we we're yeah. going the wrong yeah, way. I, I guess I did, and I guess I just don't see why the two things are tied together. Right. You know, why, why eliminate the one good thing because you're doing this other good thing? Because the other good thing has its own justification. I guess the idea is that you couldn't plant trees under a canopy. But you could still plant them somewhere, or they could go into well, I'm a saying, if it's not, If it's not a tree oh, okay. that's going to grow 100 feet, so it, yeah. if it's just a, if, if it's a, if it's a decorative tree that's going to so grow. So we're saying if you're going to put up PV canopy, then you, then you don't get, get a somewhere pass else. for. Yeah, you don't get a pass for. We'll still do the same somewhere. calculation. Right. Yeah. Or you have, to, if your tree is there only to provide shade rather than to provide landscaping. If it's there only to provide shade, then the PV provides the shade. But if it's to provide landscaping and break up the parking lot, then you've eliminated that and you've That's got I'm thinking, the give them a pass on requiring a shade tree, but yeah, don't right. give them a pass on providing a yeah. tree by itself. Or some form of 
I'm a big fan of the trees tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> if they can't do it there, I can go into the fund and go, and go somewhere else. This tree fund is just <laughs> growing. <laughs> this tree fund is growing. I need to invest. <laughs> now I feel terrible. <laughs> this tree fund is huge, I tell you. So what, what do we do? How do we, how do we change this then? Um, I mean, do you just, down? I mean, do we just do eliminate just the take admission out or, or, or do we vote that we don't support that amendment and just leave it and then, there's, and then it's, that's our recommendation to the, to yeah. the council. Yeah, you can do that. So I think it would be that we would vote we don't support this one. We supported the first one, we don't support this one, and then it goes and they still can do whatever they want. I mean, it's still, it's just a recommendation. Right. Our recommendation would be, I guess, So, but is it just 8.9H? You're fine with 8.9F? We haven't talked about it. We, we haven't. We haven't. Oh, I was focused no, more that's on F than H. Right. right. Yeah. I think. We, you, what you read was F. Well, I think both. Uh, yeah. One were eliminating the painting strips, the other were eliminating the trees, and I, I would say no to both. Oh, both. Okay. Yeah. Are there any examples of this in Northampton? So I like the, the chances of. I don't think this would ever be in practicality. And so, Mark, do you want to make a motion? I guess that covers both of those. Oh, I just saw. I just wish they would increase the ability to pull your car in there. The Framingham Mass Pike. Yeah, yeah. So something like that. Covered. Yeah. You Mass has it in their parking lot by the theater stuff. Um. Okay, so can I get a motion? For, so this is for this all of that. Second so I, I'm make a motion to not recommend three revisions to 350-8.9F and H uh, as amended. Second. All in favor? Okay. So is, is that just? That was three. Four. four. No, that was yeah. just that was four. four. That was just four. So let's go back to, yeah, sorry, let's go back to three. Any more tree stuff? <laughs> Mark's on the still board. tree oh, stuff, Mark. There's still. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, okay. Okay, three is. Uh, I maybe not have printed this out right. Um, So, um, so this is for um, amendment that would address um, in the special um, conservancy district to uh, right now and there's a special permit allowance for ex um, for accessory PV ground mounted on a parcel. That's just is it, so it's an accessory, but there's nothing for just. Um, ground mounted solar. Um, so this would add a provision under the special permit criteria that um, you could do solar voltaic non accessory ground mounted when the following conditions exist. The location of the system has not been in agricultural production for at least 25 years, and the location is over soils that are not considered prime agricultural soils as listed by NRCS and Department of Agricultural Resources. And the panels are located within 100 feet of a power line and or pole, and the system will not exceed 8 kW. The idea behind this was that originally when we uh, um, adopted this, we were, um, and the Agricultural Commission as well was concerned that if in the Special Conservancy District we allowed non-accessory PV, then we would eat up the farm. Land. People would buy up right. lots and just put right. ground right. mounted. It's flat. It's right. Um, right. So um, this is sort of a yeah. tiny step towards right. thinking about well, maybe there are some occasions right. where yeah. it makes sense. So with these stipulations, still special permit, but in order to even apply for a special permit, you'd still have to meet these things. So what's the twenty? Where did the twenty-five years come from? I mean, is that like our other communities doing that, or is that like a like um, generation of farming? Like yeah, on, I like, mean. It's generation of family farming or something. Right, right. So it's the, it's been, um, you know, so that it's not that you can take it, your f land out for five years right. waiting right. and yeah. planning, and then all of a sudden you've got a whole um, area that's. But what if it's my 
property, and that's what I want to do. Yeah. Well, Why do I have to wait? Yeah, long? I mean that's. Um, the idea is that we don't want to lose for the greater good of the community. We don't want to use productive agricultural land. Photovoltaic seems like pretty good general purpose benefit. Yes, sir. I wasn't prepared to speak tonight, but I've been, I own special, can, uh, well, Wayne Tebow, 830 Chesterfield Road, Florence. Oh, okay. I own three parcels of property in the city of Northampton. I've been in energy conservation since the 70s. I've saved, saved countless amounts of money for businesses and so forth. I wanted to put solar in. I looked at my home, couldn't do it, trees, everything else. I dealt with solar companies to come in and take a look at everything. I own a large parcel on North King Street, 33 acres, got to cut trees. I own down the meadows a five acre piece and on the five acre piece I have a section that is non-agricultural. I, pr I probably own the property 27 years. So I says, well, this would be a good spot. I had them look at it. <clears throat> I went and I talked to different solar companies. They came to the building department and said, it isn't allowed. So I looked under the, the zoning and, and so forth. In that same area, if you, if you uh, go in Special Conservancy, everybody has it on their roofs, but it's allowed on the roofs. There's a big ground mount down there that's, that's pretty large scale, probably 40, 50 panels. I inquired about that one. Why is that one allowed in Special Conservancy, but I can't put enough for my home. I'll just jump ahead. Uh, what I w wanted to do is put down enough small scale to supply my home and where I live. Talked with National Grid, yeah, we'd do that, no problem. If it's a different utility on the other side, they don't do it. <clears throat> so then I, I went down and to the building department and I paid a fee to file for a permit. I was denied because of the zoning. And it was denied because I'm not using the electricity there. The same road, the same road I live on, Chesterfield Road, there's a large scale facility that four members of the family are drawing power off. Northampton City, the landfill, where's all that power going? It's going throughout the city. And, and it's, it, it goes on and on. This has been going on for approximately two years I stepped back and the last year I brought it before the City Council I've been to the planning department and and it's like what was stated earlier they didn't want the farmers to put large scale I says I'm not putting large scale I'm just putting enough in for my house and it's on a non agricultural piece that I don't or I grow straw and so forth down there hey so Going through this whole process, I mean, uh, countless hours, countless research, everything else, and there's all kinds of funds that come back. I, went, I got a hold of, uh, uh, not senator, but uh, other politicians. They didn't want to mix up in city politics. And, and yet, everybody can do it. I can't do it for my, for my house. That, is, that, is, that isn't right. And, and it isn't large scale like, I asked how many people in Northampton, there's 3,000 acres in the meadows, how many people have applied? And I never got an answer of how many people. Industry maybe, or somebody who wants to go big scale, but not somebody small like me. And everybody, like I said, everybody on the street, the whole airport, everybody else has got it. We get grant money, everything else. You go to the mass laws, they say you can't discriminate on it and so forth. But you try, but you, I went to just, uh, the attorney general and they don't want to get involved with the cities and towns, with the politics and that. I mean, if I wanted to hire a top notch lawyer and pay a lot of money to put in a few solar panels, I, I, I believe I'd win the case. But now it's come to this and believe me, 
if I wasn't retired and had to put in all this time, and I'm, up, and I'm up in age too, is it even worth it? And not only that, the incentives are dropping. The SRECs one and two dropped as of March of 2018, and everybody's out straight now putting them in. If it isn't by March of uh, uh, 2018, you will lose approximately uh, on a small scale for a home about $8,000 in the payback. And I've lost countless before on the SRECs. So now even, even with this passing, it's kind of a, a battle trying to get it in. I'm not going to disagree. I'm uh, having just returned from the Midwest and flying over and seeing wind farms as far as the eye can see with hundreds of mills, which is which is on agriculture land that farmers have done because it's another revenue stream in the difficult. I mean, I have a hard time telling somebody what they can and can't do with their own property. And 25, I mean, 25 years seems, I mean, that's a generation. That's, you know. Well, to, to me, the, the first and second point might be redundant. The 25 years and the, the second one, the prime agricultural yeah. soils. If, if it's not prime agricultural soils, then wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for the last 25 years, right. Yeah. So I think right. it's, to me, I, I, I wouldn't use the first one and I, I could, I guess, use the second one. But then I, I agree with you a little bit. It, my house, I, I tried to do, looked into solar, couldn't because of all the trees. Yeah. And it's counterintuitive to me to cut down a bunch of trees just so I can get solar. So I ended you up. You made that point. I, exactly. <laughs> so I ended up with it, so a deal, so I own part of some solar farm somewhere, you know, on the Mass Pike or something. Yeah. And so it makes me feel good and I don't cut any trees down and I get, you know, a, a, a reduction. So I, I hear what you're saying and it, I get the intent of this, um, but in this particular case, that would, I imagine, be deemed prime agricultural soils. Down I, I have no idea. Well, well, I mean, he, um, Mr. Thibault is just saying that he has a portion of his property that's not prime, so oh, potentially no, no, no. It could. I said, <laughs> why it? Could I grow something on it? I think. Any piece of dirt you dig down the meadows, you're going to get the same consistency of the soil. What I have is when I drive into my field on the left side, it was a natural, it's the, the land is about that far above the roadway in that one area, and it's a natural hill, and then it, it slopes down. The rest is all total flat, that's what I farm. Could I farm that hill? Of course, you can farm any hill, right? The soil, is, the soil is going to be basically the same. There's not a stone in it. I, I have a hard time <laughs> telling somebody what they can't do with their property. I, I, I mean, this is, to me, this is, you know, this is, if, especially agricultural land, which is meant to be in production, then what that production is, I mean, that's like, to me, this is like saying, well, you can grow tomatoes, but you can't grow cucumbers. Well, I'm thinking on Chesterfield I mean, Road, and now if we're talking about the same one, yeah, I'm sure that, that, that right. uh, big piece of property with some horses and so right. forth, and we allowed a PV, a ground mounted, right. is that agricultural soil? I mean, you no, but it's a different zoning district. No. The idea is okay, yeah, yeah, special okay, conservancy okay, yeah, is okay. prime agricultural yep. land. So we can treat different properties throughout the city differently yep. based on their. Um, but from a, from my uh, very long ago liberal arts college economic degree, <laughs> you know, who's to say what prime agricultural soil is? The farmer, the person who owns it. The, they're well, they're going to be pretty like nice. NRCS, yeah. yeah. no, like that's, yeah. That's why NRCS is NRC, uh, yeah. so like, primary agriculture. That's the, that's the sort of the standard. It's not something it's not saying objective. I can grow, it's, you know, an well, acre of alfalfa. Well, where that large, that large array, as I told you, by the yeah. airport? Yeah. There's a hay field right next to it. That's the same thing. You could take, a, you, you could take, but the way it was written here, you had to use the electricity there. The other thing is there were exemptions specifically for airports and landfills because 
the airport can't, you know, you can't farm on the airport. They need to leave a certain amount of space because of, you know, the rules. Um, so there, the zoning specifically incorporated certain circumstances where it made sense to have um, PV array. So this is really about the restrictions now are in place over the prime soils in the city for agricultural production. And, and, and is the soil restriction that's tripping the applicant up the fact that you have to use the power at the site because that's what that's what I meant on like on my house I, I couldn't yeah. I can't we but. only we don't allow non accessory we allow if you have a house there you can put it on your roof or you could potentially put it on the site if it's for sourced for that um, structure right but you can't no, he's trying to no he's trying to somewhere else not, is, yeah, somewhere uh, else. how far away oh. Is it it's not on the well, same uh, same grid, same power company. But it's not. Okay, got, I understand now. And, and the other thing, I just picked up. I was looking through some uh, a newspaper article that about 130 homeowners in Northampton sell solar credits through the COG for the excess energy credits they produce. So they're not even using. This is excess they're using. And East Hampton does so much in that article and. Uh, in another town, but Northampton is one of the highest, next to Amherst, I believe. So that's basically the same thing. But I'm not looking out to make. I want it. I want it so I can. Well, I want to do the same thing. It, is odd. it does seem slightly odd to me that we would limit right. solar panels and not like tobacco. Like it's you know it does seem somewhat arbitrary in some ways that. Well, but we do want to make sure we're special good sources yeah. for right. the population for the future. I mean, we've lost farmers, we've lost farmland over the years. You know, in terms of sustainability, we want to be able to continue to grow food that's, um, you know, close to home. So there was a concern about just opening the doors and saying, okay, eat up all the farmland with, you that, know. That isn't opening the doors. It's, 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 you're, you're, it's small scale. And it's limited to so many kilowatts you can produce. It ain't that I can go put three or four units up and overproduce and sell all the credits. The other thing, the other thing would be, what if a person turns around and says, "Well, I got that acreage. I don't want to farm it. Maybe I'll just scrap the land and everything." What benefit is that to anybody? I mean, I'm still using it for agriculture. The majority of all the property. Is there a percentage? I mean, it seems like if someone is just using it for a, if they can prove that if they can only build, I mean, I know nothing about solar arrays, but if they only can build five, because that's what you need for a family of four, you know, should should that be allowed? But property. that's what <laughs> the system this, ordinance, is, is this ordinance is yes, trying to allow a little bit of it. So okay. that's what's on the table now is nothing now that's not accessory. This would allow a little bit with these stipulations. So if a little bit, if to me, if you eliminated this first stipulation and allowed two, three, and four, which would allow a little bit in these yes. certain situations, right. but then with the added one, I don't. I don't know that we that I see the absolute need to have the power generated from this limited instance to be used at that site. No, this this provision it that, is right? saying no, it doesn't deal with that. I know. No, no, no. It is. This is a special permit provision proposed to be added to allow <laughs> non-accessory. So this would mean you could do what he wants okay. to do. Okay. <laughs> That's the whole point of this. Basically, I guess one okay. more question in the Special Conservancy District, are, I mean, aren't all the soil are all the soils considered prime agricultural per NRCS? Like, is that why they're in the Special Conservancy District? That's not why they're in the Special Conservancy District because it's the floodplain. Okay. So there are areas that are, tr you know. So there, I mean, I'm just of the curious if like the second bullet is never going to be met. Like, right, is that right, a condition right, that right. is never going to allow somebody because if you're in Special Conservancy? There's By like default, a 99 sure, percent right. chance or something. So like I'm just curious. I would go. I would go along with Mark, except I would 
I would say I'd support it if it was three and four, but not one and two. If you took out one and right. two and left three and four, I'd be okay. Because I'd, by its nature, eight KW is going to be small anyway. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, I think it's accomplishing what you want to accomplish, and it allows it in a little. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit less restrictive about where it's allowed. I thought one and two is in an effort keep to keep farmland. Right. Unless that farmland. Right, right, but I think. But what if the farmland. farmer wants to be? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's no, the I, I don't say. Yeah. 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 But I think what John's saying is it's still going to limit it. Yeah, it's still going to be. Yeah. Still yeah. It's still, you're right. still going to have this huge expanse. Right. All of a sudden, because it's economically, you know, whatever attractive for yep. right now. Right. They, they, they do list on si on the sizes. And small scale is, uh, I believe, up to 10 kW. And I believe if you go over that, it's different rules with yeah. utility and everything okay. else. Yeah, then you're going so to if it's small right. scale. Right. Yeah, yeah, right. That's a whole so if it's yeah. small scale, it's small scale. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I'd be supportive of three and four, but not one. Okay. That I can would do. be my. I can go along. Yeah. With that. We're ready to close. Motion to close. Okay. <laughs> okay, so would someone like to make a motion on, I guess it's number, this is number three. three yeah. Motion to recommend to city council uh, change in ordinance change for 350 attachment 18 SC district uh, to recommend the following two bullets, um, solar, vo solar photovoltaic, non-accessory ground mounted would be allowed only when the following two conditions exist. Panels are located within 100 feet of a power line and or pole, and the system will not exceed 8 kilowatts. Kilowatt hours, kilowatt something, 8 kW. Yep. Okay. All in favor? Oh, second, sorry. Second. Mark second. All in favor? So this is, we've already voted, but it's a special permit anyway, so it would, it would We'd still have, debate. Still have a big, all broad discussion about the whole thing, so. Okay. Thank God. <laughs> uh, three. So five. Okay, so adding a site plan approval criteria. Um, so this is if you're in site plan that um, adding a new subsection that for any new building, so in additions, so of over 2,000 square feet or if other site plan is triggered, the applicant must show that the building is designed to accommodate solar power, power installation. This is met by showing that the roof design can support panels and that the roof orientation, conduit, electric service will be incorporated so that installation can easily be added either at the time of construction or at any point thereafter. Alternatively, the applicant may show that the site is designed to accommodate solar with conduit to be located to accommodate the ground system. Planning board may waive this requirement for green roofs or if the applicant provides information to show that either the building mounted or ground mounted systems are impractical due to site constraints or orientation. So if you're in a skinny rectangular lot that is surrounded by 100 foot trees, you can just say, I'd like to, but I can't. You just got to prove it. There's no possible way that I could. So, um, but this is also saying for the addition. So let's say you had a skinny lot and you were built adding on and it was over 2,000 square feet. And it's not for a single family home because single family homes don't trigger site yeah. plan. So, um, or a commercial use, 2,000 square feet. Even if you're surrounded by trees, it's saying you don't have to install the PV. You just need to show that the roof loads can accommodate it, that you have a conduit so it's there so that if you don't want to do it, someone in the future could potentially do it. Well, it's not just the roof load structurally can support it, but the roof orientation and so forth is, right. is lends itself to PV. But if you have a pre-existing three-story building and you're adding to the back and it's the orientation is all wrong, you can't. Right, so, so then, then you, the you ask for the waiver and you just, yeah, so, okay. That's, that's pretty, like, novel. Like, that's, that's pretty bold. Aggressive. Yeah, yeah that's kind of great. 
She's like, oh, that's what we do here at Northampton. I mean, that's, no, that's that's really like quite impressive. That's like a very impressive ordinance. Is it a huge? I mean, in terms of design? Cost, uh, yeah, the cost of, of that kind of. I mean, the cost of a building a roof that's that much stronger. I mean, there's lots of ways. It's it's a huge cost. I mean. And, and global mass extinction due to climate change is also a huge cost. Oh, I mean, okay. I kind of feel like if you're going to do an addition or an, you know a new building, like we got to force people to think about what you know, like this is like the whole idea of sustainability. Like we're just going to push costs to somebody else. So does this like Valley CDC? Do they need to do? Can I just comment on that? Sure. When I when I read that in there, I wanted to. I was kind of against it, but I went and talked to the building inspector. And he basically told me he wrote it. But he said that, and he gave me the reasons why. But he said that that's going to change anyways with the new mass building codes. But if, but if you think about it, think of all the hundreds of houses in, Nor in Northampton that they put solar on. They were right. built in the 40s, 50s, right. 60s but Absolutely. they were inspected by the building inspector. They had to be to get the permit. Right. They were approved. Our so, house has it. It wasn't built to yeah. have it. It was so, put on afterwards. What I was, what I was questioning is, what would be the added expense, expense of when you build a new house 2,000 square feet? Or, what is the extra expense if these houses were built back then and they were they're approved? But what he, what he, but what he used, too, is that on a lot of your commercial buildings or flat roofs where they put these ballasts up there to hold the panels down, that's basically what he's worried about, all that extra weight they put on there. It, it, yeah, to me it, it seems like it, it's more of an assurance that you don't, that somebody doesn't go cheap in their building materials, whatever, and you know, it, it mean, it would seem like if you're using good standard materials and Mark's the expert, right. not me. It's kind of it would, it's not really going to add. It's like an extension of now of like the stretch code or yeah. sustainable design or something like that. But I'm, to your point, like the Valley CDC project, mm -hmm. there aren't a lot of trees in the area, but the orientation of the lot is maybe it doesn't lend itself. Right. I can see, does this become unduly burdensome to applicants where 90% of the time it's not going to work, but then they have to add this added step to show that it's not going to work. You know what I mean? Or can we change this the responsibility of that showing part and just say if that we can provide a waiver if the site plan or if an engineer says yeah i mean like i think we're getting hung up on like what does that mean to show that it doesn't you know if there's a way that we can provide a waiver without having to require some other more expensive separate report like the stormwater right. reports that we get you know if it's if it's in the narrative of the application that the engineer is signing or that the applicant is signing is that sufficient to show us that they've looked at it and well, it I can't it's impracticable like you know like what is the, yeah, yeah like can I you kind of say that, that showing burden yeah I mean I guess by adding the term engineer I think you might be reinforcing the burden mm -hmm. because this language says the applicant provides information right. whereas you know you may projects that are less than 5,000 square feet typically don't have an engineer right. um, designing it so right. I think this leaves the window open the board can decide is there has there have you shown enough to us right. so that could just to, be in the course of a hearing yeah. an applicant could yeah. say I had someone come out and look, and Mass Save came out, or whomever, right. and and it's impracticable for. Or you can show the orientation say, of the building and the site. And right. And, and if we we're not comfortable, we can do like we did tonight and say, okay, no, we want we want something. Somebody to. We want somebody to come and say, yeah, this is really. I mean, if we if we just if we didn't feel like it met the standard. Uh, but how about say the the Calvin Theater is going to undergo this big gut renovation. <laughs> would this kick in and then have them required to to modify the roof structure? Yeah, new construction of or there's a renovation square feet. Well, it'd be over. Well, it's addition. Say there's an addition to the back of the or uh, an existing building somewhere downtown. Would we then force the applicant to 
have a structural analysis of, of a roof or, or move mechanical equipment on the roof to allow for PV array or something. I'm just Would it I'm, apply to renovations or just to? If it's over, I'm just thinking 2,000 square feet. Well, if, if the, if the. So if the council like came in or, or an the addition, addition of 2,000 square feet or more. Right. They, this would apply to the addition. Additional. Only to the okay. new portion okay. anyway. So we wouldn't be like undermining trigger, old buildings right, throughout yeah. town. That's what I'm just thinking if we turn into renovate. this giant thing. Right. right. I, I'm, I like the intent. I'm just trying to think of if there's a Pandora's box in there somewhere. But I mean, this is a recommendation for more discussion to the council, so I say yay. I move to recommend uh, modifications to uh, Ordinance 350.11-6F. As stated. As constructed, right? Second? Second. Yes. All in favor? Yeah. Uh, okay, definitions. Um, they're all out of order. Um, yes, so definition to large scale ground mounted. Um, so this is really just to add clarification that um, a large scale ground mounted system, if it's not otherwise classified um, as such, that um, it would be considered or classified as a private utility substation or similar facility. Um, so there are, like in the general industrial and some of the other um, districts we don't spell out we spell out private utilities and um as a use category um and so um this would just say you know if we don't specifically say large-scale ground mounted that it would fall under that classification and this and the size kind of Kind of like two, the other over two fifty. That it was smaller. This would ensure like it's, yeah. right. It's what, right. Yeah, it's right. energy production. If you're that's this big, right? Yeah. You're this producing, is a big, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm good with Motion that. Motion to recommend amendment to ordinance three fifty two point one as drafted. Okay. Okay. Second. All in favor? Okay. Okay. Now I got to try to get this. <laughs> Discussion of possible minor map change to on North King Street. Let's do the <laughs> yeah. Well, let's um, open space plan oh. kickoff discussion. I thought we we're gonna wait, make Wayne wait as long as possible. Yeah. <laughs> 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 While we're pulling something up, yeah, I want to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes from May 25th and June 8th. Second. Okay. And all in favor? Did we get that was, that's a different A&R than the one we did? Um, yeah, I don't have it, so. Oh, that was off the list. Yeah. Yep. Um, oh, great. Okay. How many of you, I guess a couple of you may have been here seven years ago. Um, but I just want to talk quickly about the open space and recreation plan. Um, so every seven years we do an open space and recreation plan. It's not required by law per se, but it's a requirement for getting state grants for open space and recreation. So in, this is actually our most profitable plan that we do. In the seven years since we've had it, my rough count is we brought about $3.2 million from grants they wouldn't have been eligible otherwise. $800,000 for Pulaski Park, $400,000 for Florence Fields, about a million and a half for open space, and some smaller projects along the way. By the back, as mentioned, leads. So it's a really important process for us. Um, and so we're required, again, where this is an open space and recreation plan, because we've spent so much time in the bike path extensions, the rail trails, we've brought the rail trails into this process. So we can space recreation and multi-use trail plan. Um, we're doing it. 
And so what I want to do is just walk you through the plan quickly so you sort of know where it is and know how we're planning to do our revision process. So um, the plan was adopted in March of 2018, which means it expires this coming March. Um, we don't really have the bandwidth to do two big planning processes at the same time. So it's our intention to start revising the plan this September, hoping you all can revise it, that you can adopt it in early 2018, because we're then going to be starting a revision to the Sustainable Northampton plan. Uh, and we just we want to finish this plan before we do that. Um, so just quickly to go through, I'm going to go through some main points in a few seconds, but the plan is a thick document. It's available online. We can send you the link if you want it. Um, but most of the plan, no one's going to care about and no one's going to change. So literally half the plan is the inventory of all the open space that we have. We're required to this format. It's our sort of institutional memory. If City Hall burns down, we still know the 20% of the city that we, we own is conservation land. All that stuff is, is documented. The, the goals and objectives in the plan, which you would think is the most important part of the plan, we is really not where we'll be revising because be, the way we make this plan talk to Sustainable Northampton is we copied wholesale all the goals from Sustainable Northampton into the open space plan. Whenever you revise Sustainable Northampton, we'll go back and recopy those goals. And then, again, as a state format, we have some inventory information, some mapping information, some ecological information, none of which has a lot of discretion involved. So there's really just one chat out of this big, I guess it's an eight chapter document. There's really just one chapter that's the important one I want to talk about. And that's sort of our action plan. So we had a plan seven years ago, we identified uh, 13 actions. Um, and then those are the things which we'll be revising the process. So what I'd like to do, if I can have a few minutes of your time, is just sort of walk quickly what those 13 items were seven years ago what we think we've accomplished of those items, and then um, what only at the staff level. So this hasn't gone before boards, hasn't gone to the public. What our brainstorming is about what we think some new actions might be for the next seven years. Um, because we keep the plan sort of practically up to date following it, it's actually, it's not going to be, like unlike Sustainable Northampton where lots of things could change, I don't think it's going to be a radical change in this process. Um, the other complication you can see in this slide is this plan is, has been approved by eight different boards. Um, and so we, we're sort of doing this process. So right now we're doing a road show. I met with CONSCOM earlier tonight, Conservation Commission earlier tonight. We'll be meeting with Recreation Commission early in September. We want to go to all our sort of our sponsors of the plan, get their input, go through the planning process, then come back and hope that you're all going to adopt the plan. But obviously it means understanding your concerns and your priorities early is really useful because I'd, I'd hate to come before you and ask you to adopt it and then have, you know, you make changes that the Conservation Commission hates or that somebody else hates, so I have to keep in bed. Um, that said, of those eight boards, there's really th a four that are critical. So you're charged with state law with adopting comprehensive and study plans. So we think, even though it's actually not quite clear in the state statute, that you're the most important body for adopting this plan. That said, because this is about conservation and recreation, the plan's totally worthless if CONSCOM doesn't like it, Recreation Commission doesn't like it, and because everything that's funded by city council is worthless if they don't do it. Um, early on in my career, this is 20 or 30 years ago, I worked for a town in, in Eastern Mass who shall not be named where the selectmen hired me to write an open space plan for them. And so I come in and I kick off this big meeting, and it turns out that they didn't tell the Conservation Commission or the Recreation Commission, and the planning board and the zoning board are in court against each other and not talking to each other. Um, so it was sort of a, a f so we don't do that here. Yeah. <laughs> just tell us who it is. I know. I know. <laughs> um, all right, so let me just walk through the, those 13 things quickly for the process. Um, All right, so I went too far, sorry. All right, so the 13 things, the, and I'm not going to go through all these points. I can go, you know, in whatever detail you want, but so of the th 13 things, one big thing is conservation management. When we did the plan seven years ago, we decided that actually was one of our big weaknesses. We've done a lot about 
buying land and not necessarily about managing it. Since then, we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot of invasive control, Oops. although invasives are not necessarily, may still be a weak point in the process. Um, the mayor authorized us. Doesn't like me. Yeah, it's changed on this, but not on that. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. But do just keep flipping. There you okay, go. There you go. <laughs> Better make go buy it. All right. <laughs> All right. So um, the mayor last year authorized us to hire a half-time position to help with managing conservation land, bike paths, and a few other projects. And so we've started to make up for some of our backlog of things. But we want to continue to do that. So we've this is a list of things that we've done. Um, the last slide is the list of things that we did. This is what staff has identified in moving forward. So again, we want to continue all those things. Um, accessibility for, for people with disabilities is probably been one of our weaker areas, so we're trying to make more accessibility improvements for conservation areas. Um, one of the big things we're trying to do is look at opportunities for mini community gardens. You're going to see this in some other slides as well. The city now has two big community gardens, 400 plots at Berksport Road and 400 plots at Florence Fields. Um, we think that's enough for people who are driving and need to do community gardening. We're really looking at community garden plots that might serve low-income neighborhoods. So uh, the one we've been working on is River Run, mm -hmm. where a large percent of people don't have cars, and the fact that we have 800 plots two miles away might as well be miles away. So we're looking at those things. So those kinds of things we're going forward. Hunting may be the most controversial part of the process, and you don't have to deal with that, but trying to make sure that we most of the land is pristine, but trying to think about how do we serve different recreation. Well, you've got to tell me what a Jeep eater is. So we purchased a piece of property that had a history for decades, I'm not sure how long, of Jeeps going up this property. Um, and it was nicknamed Jeep eater because your Jeep would get stuck, know, beaten up. Well, it was pure rock. It was like really steep. And, and in fact, very few cities allow Jeeps and conservation land. But this one trail is almost pure rock. So, so it's actually been great. We've worked well with the, these Jeep users and said, as long as you stay on the rock and self-policing, they've been great. They cleaned out three truckloads of trash this year. And so we, again, this is fits with the hunting. We don't want hunting in most conservation areas. We'd like to have three spot, spots. Mm -hmm. We don't want off-road vehicle. You know, we, we have <laughs> several thousand acres of land, <laughs> and we think having a live <laughs> trail is a reasonable amount for doing it. So it fits in that piece of something for everyone, although most of it's not going to be interesting. The last one is in the Salma Hills, which is one of my favorite areas. We have two, two user groups, both of them I love. One is of walkers, and one is of, of mountain bikers. And they have totally different visions. And that you talk to them individually, they're great. So we just need to do a little better job on working with that. And that's what a joke can do. So that's the first piece. The second one is we buy land. We buy pristine land. We set a metric um, seven years ago of 25% of the city being pristine. That's not, that's not forever. That was during the seven-year plan. We had some good press, but the press was a little bit confused. We just hit 25% of the city as open space. As a goal, we started when I started here. We started five percent, so we've been moving forward a little over a percent, uh, half a percent per year. Um, but it's twenty. It's actually twenty percent of the city is kept as pristine. This includes recreation, includes Look Park. So we're twenty-five percent city, but twenty percent <coughs> pristine. And so one of the things we just need to do. This comes up before council regularly. Is just think about what are we trying to get? Um, you know, at some point, do we stop buying land? What, what is our goal that's out there? Our goal so far has been we buy land to increase it because we haven't met our goal. But, and you saw this all with Burt's Bog that you approved, we're trying to create enough building lots in parallel that we're not artificially inflating the price of land. Um, so we, we've actually created more lots in some ways in the market, right? You have a piece of land that in theory could hold 100 lots, but in practice no one's ever done it. And then we carve out as you approved right. 12 lots and they're, they're 12 real lots as opposed to 12 theoretical lots. So we think we're doing that but we still want to preserve more. Um, and then if we're trying to preserve pristine land which is the big important thing, we also want land in people's backyards. So we have the Jeep Eater Trail which frankly is not about pristine land but it still serves an important use. We have a tiny conservation on Montview Avenue, ecologically not the most important thing but the neighborhood loves it, it's sort of like a neighborhood park. And so thinking about that, we've been playing with what is our goal, that we want to have some kind of open space within maybe it's a 10 minute walk, we don't quite have a great number of all neighborhoods in town. So you should in the evening when you come home not have to get in your car to go walk somewhere. 
So how do we do that? If you choose to live in a really rural place, which is fine, we're not going to have a conservation area around every single lot. But if you live in a neighborhood that's dense enough, maybe to have sidewalks, then, then we should be doing. So trying to think about how do we serve that purpose. And that was instantly new. We added that I think about 10 years ago, and we've had a lot of success in the area. Then you just had a conversation in terms of PV about how do we preserve farmland. We've had a lot of efforts, a lot of successes. Um, we partially funded, about half funded, Grow Food Northampton, their purchase of the land on, on off Meadow Street. We purchased about 75 acres of development rights in the meadows. So we're trying to do more of that. Um, and, and so trying to move forward in that process. Farmland without farmers, though, is pretty worthless. And so one of the things we know is for many years, for decades, we were losing farmers in Northampton. Um, that's no longer true. We're now actually growing the number of farmers in the last decade, but that's because we have a lot of sort of 30-something people who are starting tiny little farms, but we're still losing big production farms, right? So somebody has 150 acres, and they go out, and four guys buy 20 acres, and we're still losing some, some numbers. And so we're playing with more of this. This is still an area that we're weakest with. We've been working with our Ag Commission trying to think about what is it that it takes to keep farming alive. So that's the whole debate. You'll see in the next slide, that's actually one of the points we had here, is explore PV for supplemental income without uh, losing farming. And that's, that's a real important balancing act for us for doing that. Um, and so trying to think about these things going forward. The other controversy here is about no-till. So the last plan, the Sustainable Northampton plan, says how do we reduce chemical use? That's really important. But um, many agriculture um, practices that, are, that don't have any chemical use turn over the soil to control the weeds and actually creates a lot of erosion. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there's called no-till agriculture, mm -hmm. where you're using some herbicides instead of turning over the soil. And so I, I don't, I don't want to say chemicals are great, but erosion's not great either. And so we need to find the right balance and not have a simple solution, no chemicals, no, you know, no whatever it is. And so trying to do a little bit more on that. It, for Conservation Commission, for example, we own land on the Connecticut River that we lease to a farmer. We've made that organic because it's right on the river and we don't want chemicals to leach in. On Sylvester Road, we own some farmland that's farmed by one of the last remaining dairy farmers in, in this part of Hampshire County. Um, and he doesn't have an organic piece. And so it's really important to us to allow him to continue to use that land, that this 10 acres is a key part of his, his silage. Um, recreation acquisition, we've been really active in the last seven years. We've got two parcels of Sheldon Field and obviously of the um, Florence Recreation Fields we ha and the Connecticut River Greenway uh, Park, so three big recreation per projects. We haven't yet had our meeting with the Recreation Commission, but my own assessments were probably mostly done with recreation perches with some exceptions. At Sheldon Field, we have sort of a, um, uh, parcels with some gaps in them some infills, since we want to fill those infills. We have some areas where the bike paths in town, we just have an easement, and that means it's hard for us to get grant funding, so we may want to convert those to ownership. And then again, this environmental justice. These are neighborhoods that are majority, either low income or minority, trying to think about those opportunities. Because you know, if you want to play soccer or, or baseball and you have a car, we got great opportunities now. But we don't necessarily have all culturally appropriate sports. We don't necessarily have them in walking distance for all neighborhoods. So trying to think about those things as well. Um, and then recreation development. This is probably not so much things that you care about, but things like we, we've done Florence Recreation Fields and care of Greenway. We know we have some fields that are getting sort of tired. Sheldon Field and Arcanum, I mean Sheldon Field and Mains Field being the most notable ones. Mains Field is a big challenge because it's the river keeps wanting, every big storm, the river wants to take it back. And so trying to think about those things going forward. Um, we're mostly done with Canary River Greenway, but Northampton Community Rolling put, a, in essence, a temporary boathouse there. It's probably good for a decade, which we're three years into. But they want to think, you know, it takes a while to get there, think about what's the permanent solution that's out there. Um, we had, because the Canary River Greenway was so important seven years ago, we had that as a goal. We think we've now achieved it. We have you know, a, a loader up there now doing the final cleanup, but that project is 99% done, except for a permanent boathouse. So that one will be dropped on the next plan. Um, okay. <laughs> Doesn't like me. Uh, I can walk you through. Okay. 
Is it still up there in yours? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll keep going. So the next one on the list is, is recreation maintenance. That's again not so much your area. A minor, but they think it's symbolically important. We want to change from recreation maintenance to recreation management. We thought of maintenance as fixing broken things. Mm -hmm. And we want to think a little more about what's the vision for some of these areas. It's not, you know, there's some areas where the line, you know, recreation is one area and conservation is another area. But there's some overlap. Both agencies could be doing um, those exercise stations, I don't know if they're called, but you know, along bike paths where you have that the place you get. Right. What are they called? The park Yeah, exactly. Um, and both agencies could be doing uh, um, uh, community garden. So we want to think more about that and, and that process. Again, they're dealing with the same debate about herbicides um, that's out there. I think we're pretty clear about insecticides. We're not using insecticides, but it's the herbicides is where there's more controversy. Um, the next area is multi-use trail development. And that's certainly an area we've been very active in the last seven years. Obviously, it's just before seven years that we added almost 10 miles of rail trails. But in the last seven years, we've still done, we've done the Jackson Street off-ramp. We have a, you know, a, a million and a half dollar tunnel that opens up in another month from now. Um, we bought some land for a trail. We, we basically have done the easier trails along the railroad rights of way. We're working on a cross country trail. The first property you just approved mm -hmm. will be part of that that will go from Route 10 all the way almost to Ryan Road School. We just extended the trail in Leeds a third of a mile last year. Um, and we've applied for a new grant to let us extend it up to the town line, and we're looking at how can we do a trail along the Connecticut River. So the state, when they redo Damon Road, is going to be adding a mixed-use trail mm -hmm. from Bridge Street up to River Run. We want to see can we extend it up to Elm Court and Hatfield. So you know, lots of those things going forward. Um, and then our newest one, which we identified seven years ago, but really just started two years ago, was the Pavement for Parks program. So we now have three pavement for parks uh, that we've completed. So Amber Lane, privately developed on city property with our approval. Um, that's sort of near the co new coffee shop. Mm -hmm. The movable parklet in front of City Hall, and then the brand new parklet on the corner of Hockman and Pleasant Street that we just completed as part of the Pleasant Street project. We're going to council on Thursday for a parklet about 50 feet behind you guys over there, behind the Roundhouse uh, building. So the roundhouse developers will pay for it, and I'm sure they're going to be 90% of the usage. But if you want a quiet place, you'd be allowed to go down there. And so we want to sort of keep extending that. Um, so the that's a Northampton, that's a city program that property owners apply to? Is that? Yeah, I mean, it was a goal in the open space plan, yeah. and we want to work with people. Uh, so we've, have, we've set up a process. Depends on what people want. We will sign as lease property that we can take back. Yeah. Um, more often, someone's making a, it's technically a donation to us. So both Amber Lane and the Roundhouse, they didn't want to be stuck with a liability problem. Mm -hmm. um, so they're making improvements. They get to design it, but we get to approve, to approve it. Um, and we squeeze another goal. So Amber Lane was totally a labor of love for the coffee shop. They did all that. But we had one condition, which is they had to overdig about eight inches and fill it with gravel mm -hmm. and then put their blocks on top so it's a little bit of urban drainage the, the water goes in for doing it. Um, the one on Pleasant Street, which we completed, was all city designed. We're about to, we took over Pleasant Street from Holyoke to Hockman. We're about to take it over from Hockman all the way down to the roundabout or all the way down to the dike, and then we do another park right there, so sort of extending those things. Um, and it's looking at unused asphalt that's right. not really needed. So if, so if a private property owner has underutilized asphalt they may want to convert into something, they can contact the city. That's right. 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 And, and we're playing with, so, so far it's been sort of more open space, but just an example, I had dinner tonight at the Mexican restaurant on Main Street, and they've slowly, they got permission for some of the parking lot. But frankly, they've taken over a little more of the parking lot than they should. I, I'm sorry, take over some of the sidewalk. And now it, the sidewalk here doesn't meet ADA standards. So to go by the area they've taken over, you have to go into the brick pavers. It's uneven. It's not great. You know, my 92-year-old mother could not walk by that right now. So that could be a perfect place for a parklet in the street. I love sidewalk cafes. We really want to encourage them. But I don't want people in a wheelchair not to be able to go by them. So we're, you know, we're playing with those kinds of things. Um, and that actually might have more overlap with a lot of your non-open space activities here. Um, and then the, uh, the tw uh, What's going on with Cracker Barrel? So Cracker Barrel is a little controversial. Sorry, I know it's 
2015. That's right. Okay. So we raised funding towards it. Thank you. You were part of our contribution. And we've heard two concerns. Somebody who owns property down the end of Cracker Barrel Alley who's very concerned about losing vehicle access through there. And then some of the butters who are worried about sound. Mm -hmm. um, so we've slowed it down a little bit because we want to move forward in the design a little bit more. Other butters have been very supportive. We've had some couple of butters who are incredibly excited about the project. Um, we had a meeting last December, APE, sort of trying to get the abutters through. Um, and just said, okay, we'll put it on hold while we sort of move forward. But we, we have this cash we have to do something with. I think there's a solution out there. Again, there's clearly some opposition for doing it. Um, um, so the next one, if this advances, is, um, is on your screen, advance? Um, the next one is heritage landscapes. This is just a fancy term for, for years we bought conservation land only focused on, on values as open space, pristine ecological values, recreation land. More recently, we've been thinking about the lands telling a story. We've been trying to document the oral histories. You know, a, we bought one piece of land where somebody had a story about somebody built a house for his young bride, and then she died very shortly afterwards, and he I forgot, he drunk himself to death, but he basically walked away. And it's sort of a, in an odd sense, a romantic story. Um, and Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> two people died, and there's no house. <laughs> we, 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 bought, that. <laughs> we bought the property, and there are two houses in the property, both falling apart. There was no, no chance we could have restored them. And so as a condition of purchasing, we made the seller tear them down. But our historical commission said, can you leave the foundation in place? Sort of as a memory, as a marker for what it is. And so we end up leaving the foundations in place, cut off the grade, but you can just see it. There's an old sawmill, portable sawmill, the trees have grown around, we left in place, and a farm implement in the woods. Even you can't imagine this as farming land, right? The trees are big, mm -hmm. but there's a farm. So we've been trying to think about that a little bit more. Um, we have one in particular we just started on, it shows up in both what we're trying to do here and the next slide of what we're, we will be doing. Um, we have an option to purchase a piece of property where Galena was mined. Galena is lead. So this goes back 250 years when people needed their own muskets, right? The way, you know, and, and Galena went out of business when people started mining higher quality lead in the Midwest. And so instead of doing it in your backyard, you got it out there. So we have these 250 year old mine shafts. Has some kind of very high concentrations of lead. We have to work with Department of Environmental Protection on dealing with this. Um, but it's a nice story. You go through this, this, these pits that go down. The deepest one is about 14 feet, um, but it's like pure cliff. I mean, not far cliff, but it's, it's in a Northampton sense sort of a spectacular site. Um, and that fits the sort of story we're trying to sell about preserving these heritage landscapes. Um, we, have a, we have a program in Northampton where senior, low-income seniors can work off up to $1,000 of their property taxes. Mm -hmm. And we have a woman who's doing that, who's helping us put together some of these oral histories. So we hired Lori Sanders a couple years ago to do an ecological history of all our conservation areas. This is sort of the, the companion piece for, for doing that. So you're putting our seniors in, in lead mines? <laughs> <laughs> this is library research. They're not going to the field. <laughs> <laughs> I will say for the lead mines, the, the, we're getting the land inexpensively because it couldn't be developed. But the test is basically, is this safe for, for a child up to age 14 to live on the property where you might be eating and hanging on the soil? And it's not. For you to walk on, we're going to put up some signs, but for an adult who's not planning to eat the soil, don't eat the soil, it's, you know, it's pretty low risk. Um, and then the final one, if it ever shows up, is um, doing community outreach. How do we get the message out for these things? So improving public awareness. Um, and we've done a series of things. We redid our sign. We used to do signs that are big, gaudy, pressure-treated signs would say, you know, conservation area, city of Northampton. And we've changed first to Ipe, which is this wonderful wood that never breaks down except for it comes from Brazil. And now we're playing with black locusts, which is a local wood. Um, and we're making smaller, more subtle signs with nicer, Graphics. So we're doing inserts for graphics, so the signs are half the size they used to be, but hopefully long-lasting. So playing with those, we've just redone. This is the old kiosk. We've done all the kiosks along the bike path with a newer material, which is more durable, more uh, graffiti resistant, and I think more attractive, um, and just sort of generally doing it. Uh, our website, which is great in many areas, is not particularly good with information about open space, and so that's the next thing to work on. 
Um, so that's sort of what we think we're doing. But again, that's it. all the, the next steps, the 18 to 25, are just staff recommendations. Um, the process for taking this on the road is we're meeting with as many of those committees up front as we can, trying to get input. Um, we then would do a series of public forums. We actually think we learned our lesson seven years ago. We don't want to do, it doesn't matter now. Um, we don't want to do too many public forums, because one of the things we realize is when we hold five public forums, there's some people who will come to all five, and they think that their vote then counts five times as much as their vote. So we want to try to do the, a good target outreach, but not overdo the process. So we're thinking about two things. One is one of the big, in some ways, the big picture for rail trails, where we extend them, we already know. That's we've done through lots of other plans. What we don't know is there's a lot of places along both rail trails, but particularly the Mass Central, basically between Stop and Shop and Leeds, with the streets that come 20, 30, 50 feet from the trail, and there's like neighborhood cut-throughs, and they're all opportunities to connect, but some neighbors will want them and some won't. So we're going to do a walking tour where we walk and schedule every 15 minutes we stop at the next street mm -hmm. to get input on that. We're going to do a public forum early in the process, basically a workshop with no agenda beyond this, to get people's thoughts. And then the end of the process, we'll come back and say, how do we do? You know, what do you think about this process? And then come back to all the boards for adopting. And this process is a six-month process. You want to be out of this by March of next year? Yeah, but my goal is for the staff level to be done by the calendar year, just because going to schedule time in eight boards right. takes a while. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and again, we're not the next cycle for applying for grants is until June, so technically we don't really need to do it by March. But I can't really, I'm not bright enough to do two projects at once. So I want to finish this right. so we can kick off the other process for doing it. Um, so I guess the biggest, I have two questions for you all. One is any offhand, any comments, I, I certainly want. But the second is what role do you want to play? I'm happy for you to be as involved or as uninvolved as you want. Um, we've done this various ways in the past. Sometimes we did a committee from every board, but it never really worked because everyone felt like they had to go back to their full board. Sometimes we just come in regularly and update you. Uh, you know, again, whatever whatever way you want to be involved, as I just don't want you to feel, I don't want to come before you in January and you say, what are you talking about? Right. You know, and start over again. So. I can't remember, I mean, I was here last time we did this, but did we have joint hearings or were like? Didn't do joint, well, we did, we did a couple of joint, we did public hearings, we invited all the boards. And I don't think we had a quorum of any board, but a few members right. for each board came. So during the, those processes, and again, I, I can look this up. <laughs> Once we did a committee from members from each board, I don't, I can't remember seven years ago or 12 years ago, but it just, it wasn't a great success. Um, I'm just wondering if it's a slow, in the next four months, or whatever, if we have a slow, slow meeting, then you could have CONSCOM and planning board, or it seems like the rec department, CONSCOM and planning board, those are the three that need to have some interaction. So like right. you say, you don't go through your stuff and we're, we're not involved and then it comes to us and says, well, well, this doesn't make sense. Right. So, and the only way to avoid that is to have some interaction along the way. And to be most efficient, it would seem like either a joint public hearing or... That's, that's absolutely fine. The other thing we can do is, I think, and certainly after the first public forum, we can identify the hot button issues. Yeah. And then, you know, I know that for CONSCOM, hunting would be a hot button issue. That may be something that you guys don't care about. I think herbicide use for both CONSCOM and recreation is a hot button issue. Again, that may be something you don't care about. Parklets, I don't think CONSCOM or recreation care about, and I suspect you all do. Right. So it may be that even though there's a lot of boards, that there's less overlap. I don't know, I mean, I could be wrong about so it. So if, if you maybe did the, the first, or started to do that walkthrough, identified at staff level the talking points, brought that to us, and we said, of those eight, we're not really interested in six of them, but those two we'd like to be involved in, and then wherever that goes, you know, at that point. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think, I think you know, we can't help you with anything we don't know about, uh, and right. we can't be good advocates or, or inform, so, I mean, I think that's a good, because, yeah, there's going to be things that are going to be in our purview, and there's going to be right. others that we're, you know, like, that's not really our thing, so. Right, right. I think that's a, that's a, Periodic update conversation, whatever you want to call it, I think would be you know would be helpful. Okay, sounds great. 
seniors yeah. in the lead mines especially I'd like to be a part of it. <laughs> 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 you have anybody in particular in mind? <laughs> He's moved on from trees to yeah, lead mines. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, rock hounds like it because I'm not a rock person. There's some pretty cool crystalline structure in there. I couldn't tell you what it is. Yeah. But one of my neighbors is a geologist and his eyes lit up when we went out there. So <laughs> whatever that's worth. Are you going to come over at the Dewey Nixon bunker? You know, the Dewey Nixon, you know, there's a, oh, one yeah. of the biggest um, nuclear bunkers is in Northampton still because really? Julie Nixon went to Smith. We started reading about this I during the recent North Korea news items. Uh, yeah. yeah it's, Smith campus? No, it's, um, I, my husband was just talking about it. It's, it's, I'm really bad about North. I mean, so it's like North and like in like a more rural place, like on the outskirts of town. But it's one Can of the deepest it? bunkers. Uh, it's yeah. There's some Googleable information about it, but yeah, it's one of the deepest bunkers in America, okay. which is wild. We we'll move our office. There. <laughs> I think Dick Cheney had a bigger one. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's either one of the, but yeah, it was like a big deal and like because yeah. Okay. Thank you, Wayne. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Would you I like to talk about the minor yeah, map, map change, change on King yeah. Street, North King Street? Um, so. I have, I printed out copies. It's double sided. Uh, um, is that enough? Yeah, Everybody have one? Good. Yep. So, um, if you can start on yeah, this, hey, this right. side. Um, this is way up on the uh, Northampton border, not way up, but it's on the Northampton border with Hatfield, Route 5. Um, there's some parcels that are split, um, zoning is split and the jurisdiction is split between Hatfield and Northampton. Um, and so if you, the zoom in on the back um, shows the parcels in particular. Um, as you go into North, uh, if, as you go into Hatfield, on the west side, well, on both sides, it becomes commercial there, right at the Hatfield line. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Northampton zoning up until Hatfield, right along the road edge, is highway business. So that red line on the lower part of that photo is um, the front edge of um, the highway business district. And this is the Northampton boundary. That's why this line looks so funny. Is everything on this side is Hatfield. Everything over here is Northampton. Mm -hmm. And there's this strip along here that's highway business. And then um, the front is some kind of commercial district in Hatfield, whatever their commercial designation is. Um, and then back here is water supply protection and rural residential behind the... Um, below the blue line? Below the blue line is rural residential and west of here is, is um, water supply protection. Um, and this, and if you don't know it, this um, becomes really ledgy and there's water, there's a lot of drainage coming off of this hill. Um, it's up over Coles Meadow Hill, um, Coles Meadow Road. So the idea here is that there's these commercial properties that actually straddle the Hatfield Northampton line. And in one, one in particular, which is generating this discussion about whether we should maybe do a minor expansion of highway business is that, um, this Stiebel um, manufacturing company uh, wants to expand, but once they start expanding, it'll be in Northampton jurisdiction, mm -hmm. and it's residential zoning. This is, t t you're talking about the purple piece Where the of purple triangle yeah. pieces, Got that it. building yep. is a Got commercial it. industrial use. Right. Um, so the idea is in order to allow them to expand their building, to extend the highway business zone so that they could meet the um, standards for, you know, they would be in a commercial zone. Um, and there isn't really, this is back land for that property. It's not going to be developed from the Northampton side at all. It, in fact, it backs up to the property that the city just acquired for open space. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and this curved line, the reason why it's not just along property boundaries is that we wanted to extend the HB district and not just create an isolated section of highway business. And so it runs along this topographic line. That's what that curve is. And um, 
there's no magic about that necessarily, except that it probably doesn't make sense to encourage commercial development going into the ledge mm -hmm. and up the hill. Mm -hmm. So um, this is really just, um, and it would help this other property south of the um, property that we know wants to develop, it adds a little bit more of commercial land to that parcel as well. So that's all this proposal is. So basically, I'm just putting it out there. Um, uh, the applicant, the uh, prospective applicant had come to us to ask what would be necessary to get a project done. Um, it would require rezoning, so I wanted to show this to you. We haven't proposed it yet in any formal sense to city council, but I wanted to get a sense of you know, where the board felt um, this might go and if you wanted to be a, a co-sponsor with um, planning office or what. And that's it. What's the yellow line? Um, that's just, that's the start, the edge of the rural residential below there. I just was trying to designate it with a different, it's on top of the other red line for highway business. So it's just where the highway business meets the rural residential right. zoning. Yeah. Any logical? Do you need okay. a, I mean, can we, can we just? Yeah, just it's consensus. Or do yeah, you need consensus a motion? is fine. I don't okay. need a motion because what would happen is I would go ahead and put the ordinance, formal ordinance, yeah. together. It would yeah. go to council mm -hmm. and come back. Yeah, so I mean, that's it's to make sense. Yeah. Okay. I get a motion. Please. Motion to adjourn. That's and all in favor? Yes. Yo. Look at this because the city just bought that. Okay.